This video contains subject matter that may be offensive and disturbing to some people. If you are the type to require a warning throughout a video or show, let this message serve as your warning. This channel discusses the harsh reality of true crime. If this warning is not sufficient for you, consider a different genre and unsubscribe from my channel immediately. What's going on? What are you upset? What are you upset about this time, Blue? What's going on? Hmm, must be something outside. Oh well. Yard. Yard. Well, how's everybody doing? <laughs> Might be the smallest turnout in the history of our show. Look at the uh, numbers there. 74 people. Wow. Yikes. 81 now. 81. Yeah, not too bad. And don't send me links or anything, Raven. Just let me go through the two Daily Mail articles and we'll, we'll call it good. Okay. Because it just always throws me off. Hey, Gray, I sent an email. Then I have to go over to the email. All right, so we're at 91 right now. Awesome. <laughs> Everybody shopping on Friday night? That's crazy. Yard, Linda Howell. <laughs> All right. Yeah, who cares if it's Black Friday? I mean, it's like, who, who the hell goes out to a mall anymore anyways? You just do Black Friday online. Yeah, we know it's Black Friday, everybody. Nobody has to tell us it's Black Friday. Everybody needs it. Everybody knows what the hell Black Friday is. Okay, so go ahead and um, send, you know, I, I mean, what, what's weird is just go to Amazon, for God's sakes. They have everything on there. Or various websites. All right. Oh, you're going to go out and get the, uh, the nanobots, Raven? Going to have those shoved into your arm? <laughs> awesome. Yeah, we, everybody knows that the day after Thanksgiving is Black Friday. There isn't a soul out there that doesn't know that. Yeah. So it's almost like it's patronizing when you tell people, Hey, it's Black Friday, everybody. Yeah, everybody knows that. And then it's Cyber Monday on Monday, okay? Yes, isn't that awesome? Hey, everybody, on Monday it's Cyber Monday, all right? Yeah. Let's see. That's right. Hello, Hater Nation News Network. <laughs> Who doesn't know tomorrow is... Oh, God. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm the greatest rapper there ever was. The greatest rapper there ever could be. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Let's see. <laughs> been wondering if you've been fishing lately, but I forgot to ask. Nope. Have not been fishing late lately. 
if and this and never that. You can't rap, so I do that. <laughs> Remember that? The Aussie? You know, those violent Aussies out there? <laughs> I mean, my God, it's a... Uh, every time you turn around, there's something else. Now there's a 17-year-old killing, killing a lady and burying her in, in her own yard. Wow. Whew. Unbelievable. I give everyone money for gifts, so shopping is done. Well, there you go. That's actually probably the best way to do it, right? Because then people can just buy whatever the hell they want to buy. Look at this. We're, we're, we're at like half the normal number, though. <laughs> it's almost like the... Or it could just be like families in town for people, so they're still hanging out with them. But we had more on last night's show on Thanksgiving itself. All right, I'm gonna get started. I don't know where the dogs are. Probably outside at this point. All right, we're gonna do the uh, the Jetstar pilot, Gregory Lynn, of in Australia. Okay. So this is from, well, the 25th, I guess it was updated. And this is the case, remember the elderly couple who went missing, but their campsite was completely burned out, and then a, their vehicle next to it was singed on the side. All right, so the suspect in that case is this guy named uh, Gregory Lynn. It's this guy right here, actually. They have other he has dark hair in some of the pictures, so who knows? He has a hat on, obviously, in this one, so you can't tell. Yeah, I ate way too much food yesterday, you guys. Like, I was just... I mean, I probably shouldn't even have done a show, but I just wanted to keep the, the, the record going, you know? Like, I haven't missed one in a long time. So, Art Bell used to do basically a show every day, back in the day. Oh, there goes my stomach. Again. All right, pilot Gregory Lynn has been charged with the murder of two elderly campers who have been missing for 20 months, secret lovers, Russell Hill 74. What a crappy way to have that revealed. And Carol Clay, 73, haven't been seen or heard from since they snuck away on a camping trip to Victoria's remote uh, Wanagata Valley. Or whatever it was. Wasn't that it? Wanagata Valley. <laughs> well, I guess we can go over there. That's probably... Down in this area, right? Maybe. And no, don't send me a map. Don't send me anything. Just let me work through it myself. Thank you. All right, where is the... Uh... Putting it for now, okay. Uh, secret, secret lovers, okay. The case looked likely to go cold with no major breakthroughs or suspects until now. And this is uh, a couple years old here. Or, well, actually, um, March it'll be two years coming up. 
The case looked like it was going to go cold until now, and so these two people were obviously cheating on some other significant others. Uh, Russell Hill and Carol Clay. Thanks, Jessica Schubach. Uh, pretend that I'm Black Thursday, okay? Black, Black Friday, I mean. <laughs> pretend that it's Black Friday, you know, so we can get keep on trucking here. Assistant Victoria Police Commissioner Bob Hill said detectives are hopeful the couple's remains will soon be located after a second crime scene was established on Thursday in the Great Alpine region. Hey, do you guys remember a long time ago? I'm just going to pause it really quick. You know, um, I don't know if you guys, if you guys remember, but there was this, uh, I, used to po I had an Amazon link in there. Because the thing is, is if, if you guys used a link that I gave you to shop for whatever you shop for on Amazon, they actually give a percentage back to the person you got the link from if you're in their partner program, but it doesn't cost you any more. And so that would be other income coming in. And it would just be like this passive thing that you wouldn't even know about. Like if you bought a... Uh, a stereo or something, and it was three nine three eighty seven. I would get like a, you know, the income would come in from me providing a link that got you to Amazon, even if it wasn't the same item that I, you know, like I would send you over there to buy a drone or something. But then you go to something else, it still ends up being revenue for uh, this channel. But I don't know. It seemed, doesn't seem like anybody really did it. But it's so easy to do. It would just send you to Amazon. You buy the same shit you would normally buy. And boom. That's not really that much, the percentage. It's like a tiny number. But uh, It was a whole bunch of different links that I had set up. Nobody ever used them. So <laughs> I just feel like I should just do one link and then put it somewhere and if you guys shop for Christmas or anything on there at least it would yeah part of it would go somewhere instead of just going you know to directly to the Amazon and the vendor there would be this little commission part the same cost to you though I know I use Amazon all the time myself yep and thank you very much, Lane S. Now I can't remember if it was Laney S. I think it's Lane S, right? Oh, was your your uh, was your birthday was on uh, Wednesday? Oh, well, where were you? Okay, Mary Lou, you got to sing for Cindy Lynn. She uh, she's more of a fan of. Um, aren't you? Don't you like John Boy more, Cindy? I can't remember. Don't you like John? Not John Boy, but Timmy more than um, Mary Lou. Let me know. One syllable. You're right. I don't know what that means. Oh, one syllable. Lane. Okay. Which one, Cindy? Team Mary Lou with a hot crush on... Oh, you're on... Oh, I see. All right, so Mary Lou, you got to sing. Uh, happy birthday for Cindy Lynn. <laughs> what? Oh, I got to sing now, oh, gee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that means you were listening. You pretended you were sleeping, right? Because if you were actually asleep, how would you know that I said you had to sing... For her birthday. Well, you got me there. You got me there. Okay. Happy birthday to Cindy Lynn. Happy birthday to Cindy Lynn. Happy birthday to Cindy Lynn. What the hell? 
What was that at the end? I was just trying to do differently than me trailing off. Happy birthday to you. Yeah, like that. That's. <laughs> oh yeah! Woo! That was awesome, Mary Lou. That was fantastic. Oh boy. What do you mean, oh boy? I thought it was really good. Well. Nobody did it all. As a matter of fact, your favorite fan, Zozo, said that was horrendous. Okay. Um, next thing you'll hear out of her mouth is that was rubbish. Okay. Because that really was. Gosh, Gray, that is very nice. I tried really hard. Oh, boy. Anybody believe that? I sure as hell don't. Okay. Um... <laughs> <laughs> she gave it a shot, though, huh? She tried to get that high... <laughs> yeah. All right, so these, these, this is the couple that disappeared. Uh, Assistant Victoria Police Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Bob Hill said detectives are hopeful the couple's remains will soon be located after a second crime scene was established, I wonder how they did that, on Thursday in the Great Alpine region. So I wonder, let's see where that is. Is that in here somewhere? That's ah, so way over here. Wow, okay. Well, that's great. I wonder if that counts. I mean, maybe that's part of the, the the great Alpine region. All right, let's see. Uh, this has been an exhaustive and complex criminal investigation, he said. Numerous persons have been interviewed, vehicles inspected, and data analyzed. Police have also adopted unique investigative techniques with which culminated in Monday's arrest. Lynn has been in police custody for three days after being arrested in a dramatic in dramatic scenes where helicopters swooped on him at a remote campground. Wow. What the hell was he doing out there? Okay, so this is a map we can go f figure out here. So let's see. If I zoom in. Okay, Caroline Springs. Oh, so this is... Oh, they don't, it's not really the greatest map in the world. So what are they saying? Police release image of blue four-wheel drive they believe may have been connected. Police arrest a man, 55, in Caroline Springs in Melbourne. Melbourne. And then let's see. Russell Hill picks up his secret lover, Carol Clay, from home in Pakenham before the pair head camping. Okay, so let's see. Pakenham. So they live right right in this town here. This is where uh, we'll just say uh, Carol and Russell set out. Okay. And then they apparently, Mr. Hill makes a call via radio from uh, Winnegata Valley. The last time anyone heard from the couple, that was on March 20th. On the 21st, campers find Mr. Hill's fire-damaged Toyota Land Cruiser at their campsite near Dry River Creek track. Okay, let's see if we can... Uh, find that dry river track is that oh it's way over here is there any street view or anything up there? Oh. well they've got little uh 360 degree images around in here. 
That's pretty cool looking. See this little uh, Bigfoot right there? You can see it kind of peering out. Uh, a lot of people would have missed that, not me. Eagle eye he is. Hmm, that gives you a really clear look of what it looks like out there. So apparently over in this area right here. Now we don't know exactly where on there. May may have been well they drove there, so it'd have to have been off of maybe something like that. But there's no street view on there anyways. <laughs> Alright, so this is where they were picked up and they did that route that you could see. Made it all the way up there. Um, I'm trying to, I wonder if they're actually, I think they just put the pin right at the Wanangata <laughs> campsite there without really being specific. Well, now right here it says suspension bridge and drop toilet and they have a campsite. So let's try to zoom in over here and see if that pops. Uh, I think I already see it right there now they have the campsite thanks Nelly bug and thank you for sending me um, a super chat on Cindy Lean's birthday very cool <laughs> uh, let's see yeah that's probably not it I think it's right up in here though yeah there we go that looks that makes sense, I think. Let me go back in time a little bit here. See which one they used here. Yeah, that looks like I think they used that. Does that make sense? Yep, there we go. So this is where they're saying the campground, uh, the main part of the campground is, or wanna wanin wounin gannin <laughs> wanna gannin. Unagata Station, right here. And then they're saying that the campsite, though, was right here, right up in this area. If I was going to use that map, right here. Okay, so what I was looking at was right there. You see how that's the same place? And yeah, that's actually that is right there they just rotated it differently and the campsite is right inside there i wonder if they put a uh ah no nope, nothing there so apparently down in here is where they were camping in that opening right there So let's just get rid of that, and boom. Let's see, Assistant Victoria Police Commissioner Bob Hill said, detectives are hopeful the couple's remains will soon be located after a second crime scene was established on Thursday in the great alpine region this has been an exhaustive and complex criminal investigation i think there's something out there right now that the fbi and um you know and they're i think they shared it with other countries or something there's, there's some crazy new technology that people are using and what i'm kind of wondering is is it satellite imagery that's really clear that they're using around the world at this point and it's uh, photos are taken every single day or something like that i i don't i don't know i, I it's just mind-boggling what they're doing we don't know what it is they keep saying we we're using some new technology to and it's like well what is it tell us what it is 
Lynn has been in police custody for three days after being arrested in dramatic scenes where helicopters swooped on him in, at a remote campground. Uh, we have located speci a specific area and we will es establish a search perimeter. While well, Assistant Commissioner Hill said he's proud of police efforts, he added the long haul investigation is far from over as the focus now turns on uncovering the couple's remains. We have located a specific area and will establish a search perimeter. Uh, police are hopeful we will be able to locate the deceased in order to find closure for the families. The heartfelt thoughts are with the Hill and Clay families. The past 20 months, M-U-N-T-S, has been a difficult time for them, and I know their grief remains as raw as ever. Uh, the mid-1990s model Nissan Patrol pictured is now... Uh, is now central in the investigation after it was pictured close to where the pair was last seen. So that might have been where they originally associated this vehicle right here. And now they have the vehicle. Earlier this month, police released images of a blue four-wheel drive believed to be a mid to late 1990s model Nissan Patrol taken by CCTV camera in the area. And that was the burnout, burnout campsite. And then look how burned the truck that uh, they used to get there is. Greg Lynn is seen with his wife, Melanie. Ah, she probably had no idea. That just sucks for her. Yeah. Lynn has been stood down from his job with Jetstar. Really? I thought maybe they'd let him fly for a few weeks during that. Oh, by the way, we... Um, in case you didn't hear about it, there's another um, uh, variant of the coronavirus out there called Omicron. They said it has a lot of different mutations on it. They're not really sure uh, if the, you know, they haven't tested it yet to see how well the vaccine works on it. But Merck and Pfizer are coming up with these drugs anyways that help fight the coronavirus if you even catch the damn thing. So that'll be great. And, um, you know, we, we've re we're going to restrict travel to South America. I mean, how, what a xenophobe Biden is. God, what a xenophobe. Jeez, I'm, I'm sure Nancy Pelosi is going to come forward and say the same thing. Yeah, well, you see how ludicrous that is, everybody? Of course, it's smart to ban travel to South America. But you remember when Trump banned travel to China, he was called a racist, a xenophobe. Uh, Nancy Pelosi called him a racist. And it went on and on and on. So do you guys see how there's some, something missing right now? So why when he says it, when Biden says it, it's okay when he says it? Oh, yeah, we're going to stop the travel to South America. Yeah, it's absolutely ludicrous. If people don't see the bias in the media and just the way things are sold to people, then there's something wrong with you, okay? No, it, it's not free society and get the hell out of here, okay? Thank you. you tell that to the 700,000 people that have, there are 800,000 Americans that have died. I don't even know what the number is now. Yeah, South Africa, yeah. Well, that's what I meant to say. Yeah. So what a xenophobe. Wow. Oh, my God. He's like, what a racist. He's racist against South Africans. Yeah. Hey, hey, Kay Borgie, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about whatever I want to talk about. Okay. All right. So get the hell out of here. If you don't like that, I can talk about whatever I want to talk about. All right. God, I hate people that just, you, when people come in and tell me to talk about, don't talk about it. You're saying bad things about my guy. Biden is an idiot. Okay, he told the whole world that Trump was a xenophobic person and was racist because he stopped travel to China. Okay, now it's great move. It's a great move. Jesus, what a joke. So why don't you look at it and say to yourself, 
that yes, that was not fair how they treated him when he'd made the same decision. Okay? It's smart on both of their sides to stop travel. And it, and it really is. And so, you know, take it like that. Okay, I, I can't stand it when people um, don't see the, the bias and understand it. Okay. Anyways, it made me think of it right then because, um, I don't know, something I just read in the chat or something like that. Yeah, just keep delete. Don't just hide the free society person. Okay. I don't want them on the channel. Yeah, he's waiting a couple days, though. Yeah. So, anyways, uh, w once you guys realize that, it'll be a lot more helpful. Uh, what we need is some something new, you know, something new in our country where it's um, the media is back to what it used to be, not biased at all, and that we have rational-minded politicians. People that say the reality instead of trying to be as divisive as humanly possible. Well, I don't know. Hopefully it'll be a variant that's not as dangerous, though. Wouldn't that be great? All right, here we go. So where were we at here? Mr. Hill left the... Uh, right up here. Lynn had been st stood down from his job at Jetstar saying it will assist in the investigation. Detectives have made repeated public appeals for information since the elderly campers went missing 20 months ago. Mr. Hell Hill left his Druin home on March 19th and picked up Mrs. Clay from her home in Pakenham in his white Toyota Land Cruiser, which was the car, I think, I don't know if that's what that is. That looks kind of crappy. He was last heard from on March 20th when he made a call via HF radio saying he was at Wanagata Valley in the Victorian Alps. The pair had not been seen or heard from since. The following day, campers found Mr. Hill's car with minor fire damage at their completely scorched campsite. So the following day, campers found Mr. Hill's car, so that is his car, with minor fire damage, and their completely scorched campsite near Dry River Creek track. And it kind of looks like it's exactly where they were saying. I mean, if you look at that picture right here, I mean, you could easily see that being right in there. And can't see a damn thing now, but... Uh, Lynn has been stood down from his job with Jetstar with the airline, saying it will assist investigators if needed. <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah, hey, hey Sydney Lynn, you don't have to be so over appeasing everybody, okay? Yes, it's great when K. Borgie, all, everybody, it's awesome, right? But do not tell me what to say or do on my show, okay? As soon as you start doing that over and over, I'm just going to block you from the channel, okay? I'm going to say what I feel like saying because there's things in the world that really frustrate me and I feel like saying it. Whether you want to believe it or not is up to you. But just the fact that you are a fan of a particular p a political party doesn't mean what I'm saying isn't true, okay? And that's what I can't stand is like just what I'm telling you is true except what I'm saying and if you don't, accept it, then go look it up yourself and go look at the things that people were saying when he shut down travel to China a long time ago, okay? So don't, uh, just let me say whatever I want on my show. I'm doing my show. If you don't like it, don't watch it. It's simple as that. All right, so here we go. Um, he was last heard from on March 20th when he made a call from the VHF radio, or v, uh, via HF radio, I mean. The pair have not been seen or heard from since. The following day, campers found Mr. Hill's car with minor fire damage at their completely scorched campsite near Dry River Creek track in the valley. Detectives believe the pair were attacked between 6 p.m. and 11 p.m. during a random confrontation with another camper who 
then torch their campsite to cover their tracks. I don't know how random it is. This guy seems like a killer. All right. Yeah, it's really not that funny, Kate Bargy. How about you just quit uh, making your dumbass comments on the side? I think that'd be better. Yeah. Let's see. Lynn was dramatically taken into custody by special operations. Okay, we got that. Uh, possessions belonging to the couple were found inside Mr. Hill's Toyota four-wheel drive. The only things missing there were their mobile phones and a remote-controlled drone that is yet to be discovered. Oh, interesting. So he had a drone with him. Mr. Hill's wife, Robin, 71, said she had no idea her husband was with another woman. Oh, boy. There you go. Yikes. Yeah, I know. There, it's South, it's South, it's uh, South Africa. Okay, sorry, I said it wrong right at the beginning. Yeah, I, we already corrected that love bug. Everybody has already corrected it. It was South Africa. Okay. <whistles> Yikes! Try listening for thirty seconds. You might get something. Mr. Hill's wife, Robin, seventy-one, said she had no idea her husband was with another woman. She said her husband had been friendly with Miss Clay for decades, but was unaware they were traveling together. Lynn will appear at the Sale Magistrate's Court on Friday morning. All right, so that was an article a couple days ago. Then the next one, another uh, Daily Mail. Uh, Mass jet star pilot accused of murdering two campers appears in court as police prepare to venture into remote wilderness to retrieve their bodies after 20 months. M-U-N-T-Z. <laughs> it's, it's not world gone mad. It's not a scam, okay? See you later. Good luck. All right. Uh, the jet star pilot charged with murdering two elderly campers has appeared in court charged with the murder more than 20 months after they vanished. Gregory Lynn, 55, that doesn't look anything like it, that picture right there. Gregory Lynn, 55, appeared before the Sale Magistrate's Court on Friday from local police station in Victoria East, charged with the murders of Russell Hill, 74, and Carol Clay, 73. Let's see. Lynn was seated behind glass, so... I mean, I guess it kind of looks like him, but it seems a little thinner or something. I'm just looking at that picture and that one. A masked Lynn who appeared from behind bulletproof glass in a cell only showed his face to take a sip of water from a cup of water and did not speak. <laughs> he took a sip of water from a cup of water. Man, that was such great detail. Why not, you know, he could tell us that there was there a paisley design on it or... At times, he dipped his head and looked at the white table before him as it immediately, as, it, as his immediate fate was discussed. Few details uh, were provided during the short filing hearing, which is the first step in what will likely be a long and arduous legal process that could take years to finalize. Lynn's lawyer, Chris McLennan, did not make any application for bail on behalf of the alleged killer who was remanded in custody. The court heard Lynn had no issues that might make his time behind bars more difficult. A, who cares if it would have? A brief of evidence against Lynn will not be ready until at least April 19th. Lynn's Lynn faces life in prison should he be convicted. Lynn will now likely be transported back to Melbourne jail where he will be placed into protected unit. Meanwhile, police are preparing for the dangerous task of entering the rugged Victorian wilderness yet again. I don't know. I don't think he would have been able to get her in some crazy them into a crazy location. It's probably just off of a path somewhere but high up. You know, probably, you know, uh, more remote, but not way far away. Because 
it's so heavy, uh, dead weight like that, it's really difficult to, to drag somebody that far. Yeah, man, I was hoping we could just all keep, move on to another topic. Okay. Uh, Lynn faces life in prison. Uh, Victorian Police Assistant Commissioner Bob Hill said police had provided specific information as to where to find the burial site. But even with detailed information on a burial site, police have said it will take days to prepare, prepare the dig in what... Oh, man, so they have to do uh, digging. I wonder if he's mentioned to them anything. The most rugged terrain on the planet. Last night, Assistant Commissioner Hill stole the spotlight <coughs> from Detective Inspector Andrew Stampler, <coughs> excuse me, who has tirelessly led the investigation for near on two years. This morning, detectives identified a crime scene within a Great Alpine area. Forensic specialist will commence searching at that location over the coming days. Yeah, it's got to be near there, right? Because he wouldn't have wanted to put them in his vehicle. So he probably went to their tent and then maybe forced them into his vehicle. I don't, I don't know how, what he did. I don't know how close to the campsite the secondary crime scene is. We have located a specific area and will establish search parameter. Police are hopeful we will be able to locate the deceased in order to find closure. Uh, I think this stuff here is a repeat. And then there is this one, an Australian article. Family of man accused of murdering missing campers Greg Lynn breaks silence. The family of a Jetstar pilot accused of murdering missing Victoria campers Carol Clay and Russell Hill has broken their silence following his court appearance. Greg Lynn was charged with two counts of murder on Thursday about 20 months after the pair appeared in a Wanagata Valley in March last year. The 55-year-old was arrested on Monday and questioned for three days before facing court on Friday. Uh, we accept the media have an interest in pr uh, proceeding. However, we do request that our privacy be preserved, the family said in a statement. We need to deal with the legal proceedings. We also acknowledge the suffering of Clay Hill's family and Clay and Hill families, and this is very difficult for them. Mr. Lynn faced sale magistrate court via video link on Friday. So this is an image. Police have begun a search for camper's body. So I guess we don't really, this is an image they sent in, uh, but we don't get to see that. I mean, if you were here, you know, I don't know where you'd even drive. This is just crazy. Way up here, maybe. I mean, it's just, that is, you can tell how rugged that is, like they're saying. Let's take a look at that picture again. There's a couple 360 degree, oh, there's one way up here. Look at that. This will give you an idea. This is right on a path here. I mean, yeah, that's just br brutal right there. Imagine just heading down into that with the evil koala bears, and, you know, just. Wouldn't that be interesting if this was one of the, was the spot? Here, let me. Let's see what we got here. just randomly hmm. <clears throat> way at the top of the mountain right there let's see if there's some more thanks Zozo an attempted an attempted uh, wave you know but with the bitching and moaning about the politics and complaining and whining and crying probably won't work. All right, there you go. Look at that. How, how do you search through all that stuff? It's brutal. <laughs> I 
Thanks, Lee D. And oh, there's Cindy Lynn. Thanks, Cindy Lynn. Mama Four. Thank you very much. Kathy Frydenmaker. Okay. Uh, police on Friday released two images of new preliminary areas being searched. Uh, we've located a specific area and we will be establishing a search parameter. So if there's two images, then we only see one here. Okay, so that's what's going on right now. Is now they're looking for their bodies way up in the rugged mountains. This is where their burnt out campsite was and then apparently you know there was a secondary where the site where they were actually killed so did he take them force them into his vehicle at one point or what maybe he killed them at uh, the campsite put them in a tarp or something then drove them somewhere and then put them on the ground and then maybe there was some blood and stuff they found on the ground and became a secondary crime scene because that seems like the only thing that would make much sense. Why would he need to burn their campsite had he merely forced them into his car at gunpoint or something like that? See, that he burnt the campsite because there was forensic information there. Thanks, Linda Howell. Yard. Yeah, so. All right, awesome. Going to move on to a different case now. Yeah, the, the arrest doesn't really... You know. Of course he might be uh, armed. Well, we don't, we don't have the apple up yet. I don't even know where the dogs are. They're not... Where are the dogs? Oh. Oh, Blue's sitting underneath my... What's he doing under there? What are you doing, Blue? Help. He's like underneath my chair over here. <laughs> Where is the apple? Well, the apple will come out later. But, uh, yeah. Are they there? Oh, there they are. <laughs> yep. Finding out. Yeah, well, we'll have to just wait for all the other answers. Australian media is really poor, so they don't share anything. The police don't share anything. You barely find out anything as it's going on so you know you're always left guessing at this and guessing at that that's why it's hard to cover cases out of there you know I mean there's some stuff you know you have to kind of dig around and yeah yeah we talked about that the other night so uh, how we spray painted it different color and yeah it's just not really Yeah, I mean, the guy, it sounds like his wife died. We talked about that. So his wife died of apparently a drug, a drug overdose, right? But now you could easily think that, that maybe that was something he did. So then you think, well, okay, so he, since he's now pro likely killed this couple, then he probably killed his wife, and then he probably has killed other people too. And maybe every time he kills somebody, he paints his car a different color. How many times did he paint that vehicle? Are you sending me to jail? I should go to jail. You're right. <laughs> That's right. I'm going to... I think I need to go to jail because of all of the meanness that I've put out there early. 
Yeah, there was a picture. Didn't you have a picture, Zozo, of the uh, spray paint? Right, that's what I'm saying. So you can't find any information on anything because they don't cover anything over there. I mean, it's just... At least over here, you got to ha be happy with the media in terms of covering crimes for the most part. A lot of stuff gets put out. It used to be a hell of a lot better back in the 50s and so forth. But. Gray, you're so mean. <laughs> yep, that's right. Ask, ask Kay Borgie. She'll let you know. And she'll also let you know what, what to talk about on your own program. It's absolutely incredible. I believe in no bail. Oh, now, now we're negative five. We're not going to get on. <laughs> we won't be getting on to anything else for a long time. Said Greg. What? Jeez. Not, wow. <laughs> so Lori Fisher and JSD both put negative. I'm <clears throat> minus seven now. I don't know what that means, Jenny. I but believe he told in his no trailer and minus Pol five dollars. Want that? What? Oh, police want that. I see. Okay, so now minus seven, or minus seven, my, and then three, minus four. <laughs> no bail. Minus two. <laughs> but that's just for a snack, so we're still at minus four. Well, and Mary's is a wave. It has nothing to do with it, so we're still at minus seven for bail. Um, Mama Four sent me in a s snack money, nothing to do with bail. Mary Glaviano was... Uh, joining in on Zozo's wave, she must be on rewind mode. So we're still at minus seven, unfortunately. Ocean wave, ocean wave, ocean wave, ocean wave. Nah, that's all right. I don't, I don't want it, Sandra. I'm sure it has all the same stuff. Looks like you're going to need a snack. I think you have to have a, a subscription to that, right? Wait a minute. Looks like you're going to need a snack. Okay, and then stay there where you belong. Well, no, but that's actually helpful because it doesn't say... Well, I, is that a negative 5? So minus 12 now. <laughs> Holy crap. Stay there where you belong, sleeping face. All right, I'm just going to... Let me know, man. Let me know. I can, I can, I can go take a nap right now. Ah. Yeah, if you want to, if it, uh, is it really in depth? Yeah, send it to me. Take pictures of it, I guess. Send it over. I think it's really lame that newspapers online have like the subscription part of it because it's like you might just want to read one article and you have to go through all this crap canceling it and everything okay we're at, that's five we're minus seven busting out gray okay thankful for gray. okay minus seven now it's minus two <laughs> yeah 201 right Is that another one? Oh, that's the same one. Min uh, minus two. Okay. You guys Thanks love the show that way. much, huh? <laughs> Man, brutal. I can't see why police can't face the trailer. What does that even mean? Can't face the trailer. Oh, what does that mean? Oh. 
Yeah, they, they already know. They got the right guy already. Uh, well, the segment means I got put in jail, RM, and I'm supposed to be bailed out of jail, but nobody wants me out of jail, so we're just going to sit here and stare at the screen endlessly. Pets away because of millions put down. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Now nah, you're an idiot. God, get out of here. Jesus. All these crazy ass COVID people showing up here. Yeah, like if you send in money to bail me out, it goes to helping my channel out and charities too. That's what I have to, every single day, I have to try to raise over $250 on here to make that work where we've donated $38,000 to crime-related charities this year, okay? That's why I'm doing this. But, you know, we don't have to do any of this stuff. There it is. So kind. Got out. And, and we'll be able to do a hell of a lot less. Like, I want to be able to keep uh, increasing, increasing, increasing so that next year we can fund, you know, four, three or four various... DNA projects, okay? That's what I want to do. But if we keep going backwards, like we seem like we've been doing, then we're not going to be able to do that. We'll just, you know, we'll just do what we're going to do. And I can't control what you guys do. Thank you so kind. And Susanna MacGillapodrick. Let freedom ring. Okay, I'm out of there. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God almighty. Free at last. Let freedom ring. <laughs> Thank you, Matt Bavia and Kathy L. Yeah, so maybe we'll do an update tomorrow on this case again after uh, I get the email with the photographs of the, the paper. But make sure it's really high-definition photos so that I can zoom in and read it. No plates, they get pulled over and fine. And, okay. Great to know there, Jenny. Thank you. Okay, this one's pretty short here. It's a cold case, Betty Sue Foster. Hardly anything out there. Thought we could maybe try to find the fence that you can see in the picture here. This is in Tampa, Florida, 1983. And actually, we should be able to find it based on that map right there. So, let me, I think I've got right there. Okay. The body of a young woman, nude and bloodied, was found in the weeds beside a chain link fence at the Progress Village Sewage Treatment Plant. Well, that might just go right there. Progress Village Sewage Treatment Plant. Is that it? Right there? Oh, wow. That's a whole bunch. Okay, so we'll have to... Let's see where that one is. Progress Road. Any of you say that on there? Jackson Harbor. Wow, there's so much. Progress Road in Tampa. Was it Tampa? Ah, slow. Okay, there's Pop Progress Village right there. And how about 
Bloomdale Road. in Jacksonville? I thought it was in Tampa. Uh, Claire Mel City. Where the hell is that? Claire Mel City. Okay, that's Tampa. Right. Let me just get through this and I'll go back to it. Uh, she had been shot through the chest with a small caliber gun. Hillsboro Sheriff deputies said the body was that of a 21-year-old woman whose identification showed she'd come from out of state. The body appeared to have been there overnight. She was later identified as Betty Sue Foster with a general delivery address in Gibsonton. There were scratches and bruises on the buttocks and thighs and one bullet hole through the chest and back of her body. Uh, whatever, so it went through then. Whatever went on, it went on inside the fenced area, said Sheriff Sergeant Kathy Keene. Investigators said a pair of blue jeans containing the woman's identification and blood-stained t-shirt were found in the weeds some 60 feet from the body. Wow, so that means the, the clothing would have been taken off after she was dead. They said two holes and blood stains on the shirt matched with the wounds on the body. Oh, and that's, uh, that's sick. So that, was a, that was a necrophilia uh, situation there. Because why would you undress her after you shot her? if you had already completed your sexual activities, right? So what this person did was they shot her, killed her, then took her clothing off, and then he probably, that's when he would have sexually assaulted her. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, why else? That doesn't, even, that's the only thing that makes sense here. It'd be stupid um, yeah, yeah. Like if he just, like, let's say her shirt was on, she pulled up his shirt, her shirt, and he assaulted her, and then he was done, and then he shot her. Why would he need to then take the shirt off and, I mean, I guess he, but this is 1983. You're not thinking, there's no DNA. Nobody's talking about DNA at that time. I mean, DNA it scientifically was known about, but it wasn't really used at all in 1983. So nobody in the public was talking about it. So you wouldn't have cared. So anyways, uh, there were scratches. Okay, whatever went on, it went on inside the fence. Investigators said a pair of blue jeans containing the woman's identification was found. County Associate Medical Examiner Dr. Charles Diggs said an autopsy was scheduled for late Tuesday. One thing investigators said the autopsy might show is whether the woman was sexually assaulted and, well, it seems kind of obvious, I mean, and if so, whether the assault occurred after the shooting, well, there you go, <laughs> that's what would make sense. The apparent spot where the slaying took place is visible to passing motorists headed north on, on 78 south on, let's see, north or south on 78th Street. So, let's see, where is that, 78th Street. Tampa, okay, that's 78, so that's 78, okay, 78th and Progress, there we go, 78th Street and Progress Street, right there, okay, and does that kind of curve, yeah, curves down, so apparently it was right there, Bloomington, 
One of these is going to be Bloomington here. Now, I think they, I don't think, uh, this area here isn't the same as it used to be. Yeah, you can see that at one time, well, maybe, let's check right there. Hold on. Yeah, so it's between, I bet it's right in here somewhere to the left. Yeah. So that's, that's people live in this area. Let me see where Bloomington Street is. Is that down here? Progress Village, Progress Road. Yeah, you can definitely see right here. See how the, on the map? It goes like that and then it goes straight out and then it dips down. Oh, I, I can see that right here. But back then there was a road that went, let me, let's go back on the map here, hold on. Well, look at that, totally different back then. This is crazy. This whole area wasn't, there's nothing there. And then they, they, have, they have a road called Bloomingdale Road. Let's see where that is. No, it's Avenue, maybe. Should be south of here. Oh, it goes to the right. So now we're, we're going like this. Weird. Okay. Progress Village. Oh, that's weird. So that's Progress Boulevard. And then it becomes Blooming Avenue. So at one time it looked like in 83 it might have gone across like this. And apparently right in the middle here is where, like right here is where they're showing on a map. And if you turn to the left, I don't see anything. Could have been, maybe there is a fence right here. I wonder if that's the actual fence. It's just overgrown at this point. There you go, maybe. Uh, let's see, I drove past it and then I was backing up and I saw it in my rear view mirror. Ralph uh, rail, rail dialed the sheriff's office from a telephone uh, inside the grounds of the wastewater complex. The body, clad only in a pair of white socks, was about 20 yards from the clothes, face down, behind a short palm tree growing against the fence. The fence runs parallel to the road. Deputies measured the deep tire impressions in the dirt across the street about 100 feet from the body and said a car had peeled away like the driver took off pretty quick. But investigators said they don't know if the tracks were from the killer's car. Sergeant King said there were no suspects. Yeah, I bet you that is the spot right there. Like this fence here. It's probably the same fence that at one time... Well, hell, what is, what is this facility right here? Just still a, uh, let's see what it is if I hit the uh, places. And this is, that's a recreation center. What's this? And that's a mall. But see, that stuff wasn't there all the way back in like 90. Let me zoom out to about here. Nineteen eighty six. 
So I think it's right in here. Alright, now I'm going to go back again. Okay, you can go all the way back to 84, which is almost the exact time. So this is 1995. And see, look at that. Nothing, there's no uh, mall over here. And I'm kind of wondering if that was the, maybe that's the treatment plant right there, though. That's a church. Sorry if you're bored, but this is what I like to do. That doesn't look like the... I wonder if that's what this was right here. Yeah, 78th Street. Yeah, somewhere right along there, for sure. So here's the map, watch. I'll zoom it in so you can see it bigger. <laughs> Maybe not that big, that's uh, <laughs> a little too big there. Yeah, so here's 78th Street, right? And then Progress Road, and then they have this Bloomdale, Bloomingdale Road. But now Bloomingdale Road isn't really there. But what you can do is have a straight line from... Oh, and then that, now they're zooming in right here. Okay, so let's see. 78. And then it's... I guess right on the side of the fence right there. But they actually have it inside. So 78th Street's here. And apparently there was a fence further left of that area. So, so if you go up in the air here, here's Progress Boulevard. See, that's Progress Boulevard right there. See that? And then it dips down, and then it joins into Bloomington Bloomingdale Road right there. See that? So it's in between Progress and Bloomingdale. So if we move this out like that. This is Progress, but now Bloomingdale's right there, but it used to be where it would go all the way across to here. So I have it right in the middle there. And then apparently uh, at one time you could see... <laughs> Like right over to here because the way they're drawing it on the map is. Oh man. So they said you could see it right off of 78th. And where's 44th then? Not there. They changed all the names of everything. So they have it about like that. Doesn't make any sense how they drew this over here. Madison, where's Madison Street? Yeah, that's Madison right here. So Madison, and then it becomes Progress Boulevard, yeah. That's right. And they have it almost like right in this area. Hmm, yeah, they just changed it up so much that it's almost impossible to determine that. Because, like, if you go back in time, even from, right, just zooming in on that close, when you watch in uh, 1995, it's nothing. Who knows what was there? And now it's 
that's completely filled in. Uh, 1995, there's nothing in there. So apparently it's right in here, but you, I don't even see where that would have been either. <laughs> so anyways, there we go. That's all I can do. I can't find the exact spot based on the way they did it. And everything's changed. Yeah, what's going on with these morons that are showing up in here? No, we, we um, on this channel, we actually believe that there really is a virus going around and it's really killing people, you know? Isn't that weird? And, I, and we also know that vaccines actually help and work. So, do, so does natural immunity. If you've caught COVID and you get over it, you shouldn't need to get vaccinated because your coverage is... Um, equal if not better than the people who got vaccinated okay so that's the reality of it and if you believe it's some grand hoax please unsubscribe from the channel immediately um, because it's not it's an actual virus that is going around and uh, it did start in a lab in Wuhan right I think it escaped their lab to one of the, the scientists and it got into the community and spread around the world. Okay? So, that's, that's what I believe, but it doesn't mean it's a hoax. It really is happening. Uh, why don't you go call the families of the people who've had family members die? One of my friends, and everybody knows her, Chasing, her husband was very close to being in a 50-50 scenario. He was about to be innovated the following day, but he just miraculously got a little bit better and a little bit better. Now he's out. All right. So there you go. Oh, we try to have brains on this channel. <laughs> if you think it's a hoax, that it's not really going on, then you're a lunatic. All right. There you go. And I hope, I hope everybody agrees with that. That's on here. Yeah, didn't believe it was real. And he probably still, even up until he died, thought he, you know, he does have the right not to take the vaccine, right? But it's not smart not to. I mean, it's not smart. Yeah, it's not. Uh, that's stupid. Double negative. It's smart to take the vaccine. All right, you guys. And, and if you've already got it, you're well protected too. All right. A woman found dead in Hillsborough County on Tuesday had been identified as 17-year-old Betty Sue Foster. Miss Foster, whose family lives in Oklahoma, moved to Florida two years ago and had been working part-time as a salesperson at flea markets, said Sergeant Kathy King. The victim was discovered near the intersection of 78th and Madison Avenue. So near this intersection. South of Palm River and east of Tampa, she had been shot in the chest. Although she was nude, her clothes were nearby and the clothes actually had the bullet holes and blood that were used to kill her. So. That means she was shot, then her clothing, and then her clothing was removed. Was she assaulted first, then shot, and then the person removed her clothing? Not very likely, okay? No evidence has been found to suggest that she was sexually assaulted, King said. I bet you there is evidence that suggests that. They, I mean, I would say 50% of the cases out there um, are situations where there is a sexual assault, they just don't tell the public that. And then later it comes out and then they admit it. Information sought on murder of victim. The Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office Friday released a picture of a young woman found dead on Tuesday 
and asked for information about her whereabouts from the time she was last seen, December 11th, and the time she was killed. Betty Sue Foster, 17, was found dead inside of a chain-link fence at the Progress Village Sewage Treatment Plant. On 78. Okay, I'm going to try one last attempt here, you guys. Hold on a second. Progress Village Sewage Treatment. Tampa, Florida. Is it in there? All right, here we go. 1985. It's going to say it got closed down, all right? Environmental agency gets okay to sue the county. County crews are working to correct problems at the Progress Village Sewage Treatment Plant, but problems at the plant were called a low priority. Uh, Progress Village Plant County Commissioner. Uh, no address in there. How about this one? And county buys land for future disposal plant. The 106, this is 1986, the 163 acre tract of land located in the Progress Village area will be the site of a regional sewage treatment plant. Hillsborough County has acquired 163 acres in the Progress Village area for the future three million gallon a day Riverview regional sewage treatment. Uh, the new property is located across 78th Street from the Progress Village plant. Huh, so let's see where that is then. Then we'll know that we've got to go across the street. <laughs> All right, hold on a second. So this was, this was going to be called the Riverview Regional Sewage. Maybe they never had this built, though. I'm just kind of wondering. Oh, there it is. Well, that's not really across the street. Uh, that's, like, way over there. And it's not even called... Well, it does say Riverview Services, but that doesn't look the same. That's way over here. All right. Let's see if there's any, any anything else in there. Okay, that's that's actually describing. There's the scene right there. That's the one we read. So that's that article. Eighty-three, seventy-seven. Progress Village Civic Council to get twenty-four and refund. Hmm, yeah, it's not there. 1987, 85, 84, 84. This is 84. Elizabeth Loudenback, 22. December 13th, body of 21 year old Betty Sue Foster, nude and bloodied, was found in the weeds beside a chain. I think we talked about this one here. That was part of a different case, a serial killer. But Betty Sue Foster, who was mentioned in this article, wasn't part of that serial killer. Murders, right? So she had been missing from her parents' trailer. Actually, I think this might be one that I haven't talked to you guys about yet. This, yeah. So that's interesting, right? So Betty Sue Foster right here is, was listed in an article with Elizabeth Loudenback, who is in the... The uh, Bobby Joe Long serial killer list. However, Betty Sue Foster wasn't. So I saw that and then I took her out of the this article and that's why I looked her up. I thought it was interesting. No, I don't get nightmares. Is that bad? <laughs> uh, county to present sewer system plan. Hillsborough County 
will unveil their, this month a 7.9 water system designed to collect millions of gallons of raw sewage from Gibsonton. Uh, let's see. Is plan Wednesday Progress Village Elementary School. Yeah, so I think this is when they started. They got rid of that and changed it up. But anyways, I did I did as good as I could. You guys uh, couldn't find it. The exact spot. I think I'm in pretty close. Uh, she was wearing blue jeans, an aqua and white pullover shirt, and dark brown suede walking shoes. Uh, she was white, five foot four, hazel eyes, long auburn hair. She was last seen at 1.30 a.m. Nothing good happens at that time. On December 11th, when she left her home near Gibsonton, Gibsonton Drive and Alafia Drive. So that's where she lived. Let's see. Gibsonton Drive and Lafia Drive. So right down that street, really, I mean, right there. So she lived near here. There's her, that's what she looked like right there. Oh, you, can you even see that? No. There, let me fix this stupid. <laughs> there you go. Now you can see more, more of the stuff on the screen. All right, so the body of Betty Sue Foster was found in the weeds inside a chain link fence on 78th Street, Hillsborough County Utilities Department. Um, and that's all they said. This is on just find a grave. That's her grave right there. She was born in 1966, so she'd just be a little bit younger than me. Yeah, like I always tell people, if you... If you follow true crime and you cry yourself to sleep at night thinking about a case or, you know, you get chills and all this shit where you can't sleep and it's affecting your life, I wouldn't follow it. I am able to do it, you know. I had a brother that, you know, died when I was 20. He was 22. And since then, it's like it's easier to handle stuff like this, you know. It's like, and I was right there. I saw him not alive and. For me, it's just, uh, you know, it makes it easier. Uh, you know, I still can let myself go there and visualize what somebody went through, and that's where, you know, it bugs the hell, you know, it makes me feel shitty and bad. But, I, you know, it's not my relative, so it's sort of weird. That's why I always feel it's weird when people who don't even know somebody act like they they are a family member and it's all to me it feels like they're trying to be um virtue signaling people like look at me i care so much everybody i was the one yesterday that made the picture with the angel wings and the candles okay uh, it's just bizarre uh, save the really emotional stuff for your you know your wife your kids your grandparents you know somebody that you really knew and cherished because man if you're gonna cry and get that upset about some person that you don't really know then what are you gonna do when they pass away yeah yeah that's right i don't dwell or anything like that yeah What's what's this person laughing at? 
<laughs> Who is this person? Man, yikes. Maybe they're just laughing at what I said. Now, let me read the other one. Yeah, what, what does that even mean, Cleva? Yeah, that was a good block. Wow, what does that mean? Where are these people coming from tonight? Just these random, like, really dumb comments. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, we're, everybody's empathetic. Support with uh, Stefa. It's just a little, don't follow true crime if you're crying. Because you need to, you know, people should be a little happier in their life. Is what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah. Uh, everybody's empathetic. Like, I have empathy for them. And I can feel... You know, I know I, I've i lost, so I can feel what they feel, but, you know, I'm not their family member. So I can, be, you know, console them and feel for them, but to have it really like, oh, my God, I haven't, like, I hear this comment a lot. I haven't slept in days over this case. Yeah, well, it's about time for you to stop following it then. Just trying to be helpful. I gotta open up this Word document here. So I put this link in the description for the Tampa Bay Times. All right, uh, the dead girl that lay in the weeds beside a chain link gate, the workers didn't notice her at first, even if they rode past her body towards the sewage treatment plant. When someone finally saw her near a sign for the Progress Village sewage treatment plant, they phoned sheriff deputies. Uh, she was Betty Sue Foster, a sometime carnival worker from Gibsonton. She was 17. She had been shot in the chest. It was December 12, 1983, 30 years ago today. The murder was fodder for local news briefs, but quickly faded from the headlines. In the years since, her story has scarcely been mentioned. The killer has never been caught. Yeah, there was almost no news coverage in there. Her grave lies on the edge of the tiny Oklahoma hometown, but with the murder still unsolved, her family says a part of Betty is still in Florida, a place they have learned to fear. They they want I wonder if she was in her hometown paper though. I didn't really check that. Her grave lies on the edge of her tiny Oklahoma hometown. In fact, let me just throw that out there just to see. I'm going to have to uh, check that out. So Betty, Sue, Foster, and it was 1983, Oklahoma. Yeah. Really, didn't even make her own paper. There, there's her name right there. I think I actually got rid of that, and these are the only articles that popped up at all. So, uh, she was Betty Sue Foster, a sometimes carnival worker. Her grave lies on the edge of her tiny Oklahoma hometown. <coughs> they want to honor her memory. Just a second. Yeah, I don't think it's bad that you, if people have, you know, you know, if they're crying or whatever, I just wonder why you do it. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, why would you let yourself be tortured like that? Um, her grave lies on the edge of a tiny Oklahoma town. If we were, if it were to be solved, I would bring her home, said her sister, Frances Randall. She was free-spirited and athletic. She loved Corvettes and Spaghetti and Steve Perry of the band Journey. She was reserved but tough and bold with a soft spot 
for those less fortunate and a willingness to stand up for little kids when they were picked on. Her home was Geary, an outpost west of Oklahoma City with wide, dust-speckled streets and no stoplights. Betty was the fourth youngest in a family of seven girls and two boys. The kids helped their mother in an always working waitress at a local diner. Betty came to Florida for reasons not uncommon to the millions who make their way to the Sunshine State. Warm weather, sun-soaked sandy beaches, abundant and varied job opportunities, and for Betty, there was a boyfriend. She met Guy Watts while visiting Florida with her sister Helen Baker, the handsome 23-year-old, worked the carnival circuit based in Gibsonton. Betty was smitten. When she returned home, she stayed on, he stayed on her mind, and soon no one could stop her from going to be with him. For her family, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, as though Betty had run away, but that she had, been some, had, had seen something, a promise, a brighter future, and spirited toward it. So she wanted to have a better future, so she went to Florida. I guess we had to accept that fact that Betty had followed her heart. All that is known about the murder is contained in a single black three-ring binder and sits open in the center of Detective Mitch Messer's small desk in a corner office at the end of a long hallway at the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Headquarters. And by the way, this article was written by Dan Sullivan. And that is of the uh, uh, Tampa Bay Times. Yeah, let's see. It's yellowed, tattered pages sit under Messer's steely gaze, one of two of the office's designated cold case investigators. Messer never lack for work. We'll deliver the latest news and information you need to know every week. Oh, this is them. <laughs> That's the article saying that. I thought it was part of this one. On the desk next to Betty's file in another open binder that tells the story of another open case, that of a store owner killed inside her clothing business on 50th Street in 1995, so 12 years later, on a cabinet across the room, are the case files of some of the more than 150 cold case cases the agency has. Whatever, whatever ill befell Betty when she died, detectives think it may have been it may have happened on December 11th, after the Progress Village sewage treatment plant had closed. So it was already closed. Uh, well, I guess for the night, probably. Uh, the spot where her body was found, a dense thicket of signs declaring no dumping, was accessible through a two-foot gap in a chain padlock gate. Now let's see if we can just, what if that's still there? Yeah. All right, one last attempt, everybody. I'm going to start right here and uh, just kind of look at, see if you can see. So that's not chain link. That's not, that's not it. Now there's a tons and uh, Florida's just chock full of cold cases. I'm just going to start right there. Let's see, maybe they haven't fixed the hole in the chain link fence. It's interesting to have those two poles right next to each other. I wonder if that was... Hmm, I don't know. It's 
So what's interesting, I have a gap in the timeline. What's known as this, two nights earlier, Betty, Betty had a, an argument with Guy Watts, her boyfriend. Hmm. The spot where her body was found, a dense thicket with signs declaring no dumping, was ac accessible through a two-foot gap in a chained padlock gate. What's known in, is this. Two nights earlier, Betty had an argument with Guy Watts, her boyfriend. When it escalated, Watts told Betty he was going to send her back to Oklahoma. She became quiet. Then she left. She told friends that she needed to cool down. She never returned. What's interesting is I have a gap in my timeline, Nestor said. We believe she was alive <coughs> for at least 24 hours doing something. Interesting. Watts, an obvious potential suspect, was ruled out. He had a solid alibi for the time Betty was missing. And despite their argument, he was not known for violent tendencies. Before long, the case stalled. Nothing developed for more than 20 years. In 2007, <clears throat> Betty's younger, youngest sister, Frances Randall, called the sheriff's office, a forensic specialist for the Oklahoma Police Department. She wanted to know more about her sister's case. The murder devastated the family and defined Randall, Randall's own life, she said, moving her to help other families get the sense of justice she had never known. She inquired about forensic evidence, which prompted a review of Betty's case. Here, hold on a second. I gotta get a drink of water. <laughs> I think this, there's a vent right underneath my desk here, and I always wonder if it's, it sends in allergy crap at me. I think that's what's going on. All right, so here we go. She inquired about forensic evidence, which prompted a review of Betty's case. So you've got to know that, think that they had DNA. Detectives discovered new DNA, presumably from Betty's killer. Ooh. The male DNA profile was entered into the FBI National Database. There was no hits. Detectives tracked down Guy Watts and another man who were among a, a half dozen persons of interest in the case. Both submitted DNA samples. Again, no matches. But it's not over. The forensic angle is what gives Betty's case its best shot at being solved. Well, right now, forensic genetic genealogy. FG, or uh, let's see. Yeah. FGG, right? Messer said something he refers to as a DNA bingo. Oh, boy. I wonder if he knows somebody on uh, YouTube. But something else could help, too. With all those who pass through Gibsonton, a carnival industry hub, perhaps someone remembers something, he said. Maybe someone was afraid to speak 30 years ago, but no longer. I've got a few people on my radar. For Betty's family... The prospect of justice always looms. They long to see her again, and ultimately, one way or another, they say she will come home. I wonder if we should give this a call here. Wouldn't that be cool to uh, do this one? One day we will all stand before our Father in Heaven and give account to this life. Huh. Well, there you go. I think this one, all they have to do is get that DNA sample, sequence it, do genetic genealogy, and boom! Use identifiers, okay? That'll get you the answer. All right, now it's time for the halftime 
break where I'm gonna go actually get an actual apple and uh, where is that yeah so <laughs> all right you guys to see Blue and Chloe behind the apple we're gonna need to raise some funds on the channel by using these types of things because it without them people seem to forget or something great has shows seven days a week yeah that's right cold and current cases with great content you got that like that's an interesting case right there and now I'm feeling almost like I need to be making a call tomorrow to say hey have you guys thought of doing the gene gene genealogy angle and if you don't have the funds, maybe we can work on putting those that together for you. After we do the Addison County one. So that one took off the the stem. Okay, here we go. There's no stem now. All right. So Eugenie took the stem. Uh oh, there's Vicky Horn. I mean, we'd like to. Uh... All right. <laughs> there you go. I'm gonna actually eat an apple myself. So we got, uh, hold on, let me play it. Mama Sheet 13. Excellent. God, they're even wrestling right now, but you guys can't watch it. Oh man, you guys are missing out. Unbelievable. Hey, Kit Kat. This is kind of like the uh, break where you can help support the channel and the charities and you now get to see what's behind the curtain. I'll have to come up with a different one. Well, I guess we won't be eating the apple tonight. We can do the, maybe we'll do the serial killer uh, tomorrow or something. <laughs> no, that's just the, no, there aren't bigger bites. I mean, people just help out what they feel like helping out and then that's it. I mean, maybe if you sent in 50, I would do two bites. <laughs> There's one, and then Mama She 13, that was Kit Kat right there. And then Mama She 13. All right, there we go.
Thank you, Sheila Riley. That all goes to it at the end of the month, too. Yeah, just leave it the way it is so they, uh... Wow, that would have been so cute to watch. Oh, darn it. You guys. Unbelievable. Oh, there we go. Take a bite out of crime. <laughs> there she is. Thank you, Hater Nation News Network. <laughs> she is pretty cute. You got to give her that. There we go, Brandy C. <laughs> I guess you guys can cheat and see already see it. <laughs> The whole apple goes away, too. And then you see the whole screen. One more bite. Man, we used to zip right through this apple. There we go. Thanks, Mama She 13. And there we go. And then. Ah, there you go. Now you see the whole. Every, both of them. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> they were wrestling a minute ago. Oh, there goes my stomach. Oh, that's all right. Chloe, Chloe, won't they stay there if you go away? <laughs> oh, blue. Chloe ran away. Blue stayed though for you guys. Well, they were standing because uh, my wife was standing right there. 
But they were wrestling naturally prior to... Had the apple been bitten away quicker, you would have seen them wrestling. Right, Blue? Right? He's looking at me when he's looking that way. That's where I am. I'm over to his right. Right, Blue? Hey, Blue, what's going on, buddy? Come here, buddy. <laughs> He's like, no, it's just so much more comfortable up here. That's weird. He's looking at the camera right there. And there's nobody near the camera. It's just my phone on a stand. Hmm. Well, we've got 30 more seconds on this. I was thinking of doing a, like a Blue and Chloe channel where, you know, it just does a live feed for like an hour a day and it's just, that's it. <laughs> you know, they're playing around and, you know, have a few different cameras set up where, you know. Well, there you go. Thank you guys for the, helping out the channel and the charities and, because we, we donate at least, it usually ends up about 50%. But from the net income from the channel, 40 to 50, and then I usually try to make it about 50% with any PayPal money that comes in. And uh, if you're new here, if you're new here, I'll just go through these again because some people wonder, what's he doing? What's he doing? Well, I, I need to support my channel so I can justify spending three hours, three to four hours on a show with the three or four hours, if, if not more, of getting it together every single day. You know, it's not like, oh, well, he comes on Monday, Wednesday. It's literally Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. It just goes on and on and on, right? So that's why, you know, there's an income. Everybody that's doing YouTube videos, putting out factual information and trying to make a difference Nobody should give a damn if they have an income on YouTube. It's the people that do Krama that when you send them a nickel, you're doing a disservice to the world, okay? Um, so what we've done on this channel is $38,000 to charity this year and 22,000 last year. So $60,000 just from right at the start of the pandemic. And that's crazy, right? But this year, we've almost doubled last year's total. And uh, we gave the Polk County Sheriff's 500 for an uh, uh, orphan girl. $500 to Rain. I mean, uh, that was that was the Innocence Project. Rain, 5000 I think I missed that, what that one was. I think No, I think it was Charlie Project. So I'll have to start over again. Uh, the DNA fund that we set up is 19500 and that's the one. What, part of that led to Daniel Armantrout, the Bibb County John Doe. We completely funded that one. Texas EquiSearch, 5050 The Innocence Project, $1,000. Polk County Sheriff, 500 Then it was Charlie Project, 500 And then Rain, which is Violence Against Women, $5,000. And the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, 4450 And the Libby and Abbey Ballpark, 2000 So that's because of you, the generous freaks here. So when you're watching another channel that's just like, Hey, do you think Brian Laundrie's arm came out of the flower bed? This is great. Do you guys think Brian Laundrie's still alive? Okay, and you're sending $20 in to a, an idiot like that? What is the point? What are you going to get out of it? Nothing. Okay, so here you're making a difference. Uh, we do something with it. <laughs> okay? I mean, you can do whatever the hell you want, but I'm just wondering in your head what's going through your mind at that moment. It's weird. All right. So, anyways... Uh, 
Yes. So now um, we're going to hit that uh, the Connecticut River Killer. Although it seems like it would be a good one for my serial killer Sunday, but I'm going to try to do it anyways. Well, thanks, Vicky. All right, cool. All right, so here we go. Yeah, yeah, put your face against a, a cold milk jug. Yeah, do that one. I mean, it's just a joke, everybody. And But people are just, they love it. <laughs> All right, so this is uh, an unsolved serial killer deal here, all right? So it starts off with uh, Kathy, this is 1978, even though they list this whole thing going on in the 80s here. Oops. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to, I, I, get, I get really down and out when I watch a Krama channel and they get hundreds and hundreds of dollars and it's just, wow, what a black, that's just an absolute black hole right there. It's going nowhere. Uh, what, so they can put out more bogus information for you to enjoy? Wow. All right, uh, here we go. Sanctuary slang, uh, bird watcher Kathy Milliken, 26, of Sunapee, New Hampshire whose body was found in the Chandler Brook uh, Wetland Bird Sanctuary, died of multiple stab wounds, an autopsy revealed yesterday. According to General Thomas Rath, said the autopsy showed she died from stab wounds in the neck, chest, back, abdomen, and thighs. Her body was discovered by state police bloodhounds in the bird sanctuary after her husband reported she failed to arrive uh, Home when expected. Now she was married, obviously. She's only 26 years old. And then 1981, there's still a group of new New London residents has contributed 5,400 to a reward fund for information on the stabbing death of Sunapee woman whose murder had remained unsolved for more than two years. New London Police Chief Walter Rennie said the new reward already has prompted one person to contact police in connection with the death of Kathy Milliken. The lead did not pan out. Mrs. Milliken, 26, was last seen leaving her job at Addison Publishing in North Wilmot on the afternoon of October 24, 1978. So let me go up to her right here. North Wilmot, New Hampshire. There it is. All right, so let's just say up in this area. This is where she. Is that what they're saying? What's that? Got like an alarm. It was uh, a scale. <laughs> Had the timer set up, uh, set up on it. All right. Has been publishing in North Wilmot. So I guess, wow. It's like nothing here. How could that even have a business in there? Hmm. I guess that's uh, where it is. And her body, uh, that's where she works, and her body was f found in this, yeah, Chandler Brook Wetland, where she wanted to take pictures of birds, right around in this area right here. So she probably went to here and then walked in, I would imagine. Let's see. 
I bet there's a place that you can pull in, maybe. Yeah, there you go. You probably drove in there. And inside, of, I'm not going to put it right there. I'm going to actually move this now because now I'm pretty sure that uh, you know, somewhere around, more in like around in this area. Right off that highway there. Uh, Miss Milken, 26, was last seen leaving her job at Addison Publishing. She was reported missing after she failed to go to work the following day, and police found her body that night in Chandler Brook Wetland Area, a nature preserve in New London. Police said she died of multiple stab wounds. Yeah. And then we have... This is just a website nothing doesn't say much at all just says on October 24th 1978 Catherine Milliken age 26 was photographing birds at the Chandler Brook Wetland Bur Preserve in New London New Hampshire when she was stabbed over 20 times her body was found just yards from where she had been taking photographs so they must have developed the pictures on her camera and it showed the scenery and then she was found stabbed to death right where she was taking those pictures. Yeah, so that's her right there. All right, then the next victim of this serial killer is Mary Elizabeth. And some of the victims don't even have any articles at all, but a couple have a, a lot. The sister of a woman missing since July 25th has been tracing her steps from Framingham, Massachusetts through Brattleboro to Waterbury in an attempt to locate her. So this is this victim, Mary Elizabeth so all these are all these yellow marks are the victims here. So this is where she started off, and then she was going to Brattleboro, right here, and then okay. So let me just continue on. Uh, so she went to visit her dentist. She left Framingham July 25th after a visit with her dentist and began hitchhiking back to her home in Waterbury Center. She planned to travel through Brattleboro, the sister said. Miss Critchley said she had reported her sister disappearance to state police in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont. She notified Vermont State Police in Brattleboro Saturday night. The missing woman is 5 foot 8 inches tall, weighs 135 pounds, and has long brown hair tied back, her sister said. She was wearing tan pants, a maroon sweater, and brown leather sandals, and was carrying a small blue knapsack when she was last seen, according to her sister. Miss Critchley said her sister lived in Brattleboro at one time and attended Antioch New England Graduate School in King, uh, New Hampshire. Right, that, that was an August, that was an August 5th, 1981 article. She went missing. Um, obviously prior to that, but it's weird. They have the wrong date on the, the actual official, you know, where somebody typed in an official, they had it on the 9th, but it can't be. Oh, that's right. This is when she was found. So listen, uh, this says a partially decomposed woman's body found by woodcutters August 9th has been identified through dental records. So she was actually found, um, Let's go back to that last article. So July 25th. So she was she wasn't found too long after then that she went missing. I mean, literally found maybe two weeks later. So August 9th has been identified through dental records as that of Bristol, Connecticut woman. State police said a police spokesman said. An investigation will continue into the cause of the death of Mary Elizabeth Critchley, 37, of the Forestville section of Bristol. 
So, uh, she, her body was found in Unity, which is right here. In this, somewhere in this area. They don't, they don't give any specifics. But this, is, this area is called Unity right there. All right, then the next victim, 1984, Bernice uh, Countamanchi. It's kind of a different name, never heard it in my life. Uh, unidentified bodies found at two sites. So this is, you know, some of these now we're starting to get like overlap and then they start talking about other victims and whatnot. Uh, the remains of, hold on, let me, my camera's way too bright over here. I need to get the, I need to put some fuzz on it, you know, get that glamour sh glow look, you know. And <laughs> just kidding. Uh, the remains of two unidentified bodies were discovered in separate instances Saturday, said the New Hampshire Attorney General's office. In Ashland, the body of a white woman was discovered at about 12.30 p.m. in the woods near the intersection of Route 3, but that one was determined that she died of exposure. The Attorney uh, General's office said an autopsy showed the woman died sometime during the winter from exposure. In Newport, the skeletal remains of another person also was found Saturday by a fisherman in the woods off Cat Hill Road. The remains were to be sent to Augusta, Maine for examination. All right, well, then after examination, a Claremont woman whose remains were found by a fisherman died from stab wounds and police are treating the death as a homicide. Bernice Cortamanchi, Cort, uh, I think that's how you say it, uh, C-O-U-R-T-E, you can see it on the screen right there. Uh, she died of numerous stab wounds according to a forensic examine, uh, exam conducted by Dr. Henry Ryan. So that sounds similar already, a bunch of stabbing, right? Like the first victim and the second one, they didn't know yet how she died. The victim's skeletal remains were found last weekend by a fisherman in the woods off Cat Hill Road in Newport. She was identified by dental records. Cordomanchi's body may have been in at the site since she disappeared in May of 1984. And so this article that we're reading is April 1986, okay? So they found her two years after she went missing. Uh, Swope declined to say if authorities have a suspect or motive. All right, none. And then Ellen Friend, there's a lady named Ellen Friend who has no news articles other than later when, when, you know, she's combined with other people, but there was none of the, her disappearance or even one that I could find of her being found or anything, even though she was found. And we have the date that she was found because Ellen Friend, uh, let's see. So Cordomanchi though, let's see. Cordomanchi is from Newport right here, but she was found Uh, let's see, where is that? In Kellyville, Vermont, right here. Right there. Like her body was found somewhere in this area here. Feels like this is like right on the border of, of various places. I mean, it's, it's weird. Like right there, there's a border. So I think you're in couple different like Vermont and hell what's this what state is out and New Hampshire right next to each other on a border and he was kind of like putting bodies on either side of it occasionally all right so the next victim 1985 is Eva Morse and I found one article on her The second body in a week was discovered Friday in woods near Claremont. Authorities said both apparently were women killed while hitchhiking, but would not say the deaths were related. The discoveries 
bring to at least five the number of bodies. Now they're starting to, you know, get a little bit nervous here. Found in the area near Vermont's border in recent years, and authorities are investigating whether any of the deaths are connected. There's no evidence to indicate that, that but certainly it's uh, being investigated. The two bodies discovered most recently were found close enough to have us concerned whether or not this is a pattern. Uh, the body found early Friday morning by two loggers in woods off a road in Unity was tentatively identified through dental records as that of Eva Marie Morse, who was 27 when she disappeared from Charlestown last July 10th. So now we're going to, for Eva, we'll put uh, Charlestown, New Hampshire. So it's, it's going to be in this general area. See, look at it. Boom, right there. That's where she lived. That's how you knew this was all a serial killer action. So this is where Eva Charlestown. She lived right there. And her body, though, again was found in Kellyville, right next to where Porta Manchi, in that same general area. I don't know exactly where you know, in the middle of the woods there, what, but two bodies found in Kellyville. Uh, Morse's death is being treated as a homicide, but the cause of her death was not immediately known. Last week in the skeletal remains of Bernice Cordomanchi, who was 17 when she disappeared in 1984, were found in the woods in Newport by a fisherman. Cordoman, she died of multiple stab wounds and her death is being treated. See, they must have thought that there was something going on and searched more into those woods and then found another body. So that's pretty crazy. All right, so we just did Morse. Then we, the next victim is May 15th, 1986. And that's Linda Moore, and a lot, and three or four of these women are nurses, which is interesting. You it makes you wonder a little bit. I mean, that's a little too high of a percentage to randomly pick out, get three nurses out of this. I mean, out of the population, you know, maybe one percent of the population are nurses, but you have thirty or forty percent of this group of people killed that are nurses. So this is Linda Moore right here. A 36-year-old mother of two was found stabbed to death in her home. This is a one that broke the his normal MO, okay? But apparently they've tied this and it's considered one of the victims. And they broke into her home on uh, Tuesday afternoon, only a half hour, or he did anyways, before her children came home from school, police said. Linda Moore was discovered at 3 p.m. by her husband, Stephen L. Moore, Vermont State Police said. They said there were no solid suspects and they gave no motive for the slaying, which occurred at the couple's home on Route 121. My wife's dead, said a stunned Moore, standing on his front lawn. She's, uh, she stabbed to death in the house. I'd rather talk about it tomorrow, he said. Police refused comment on whether a weapon had been recovered. They appealed to help in the case from anyone who might have seen any activity at the house in the early afternoon. Uh, so let's see, Route 121. And she also lives in Unity, though. So I think it was, anyways. Let me, let me do Route 21, 121. So it'd be Route 121. Let's see. Yeah, that's not where that's not what I was looking for. Now we're on Linda Moore. Sorry about that. So this is where she lived, right around in this area. 
Yeah, there it is. 121 right there. So she lived down here. And she was killed. See, look how close all of these are. And this was her... She lived in a house somewhere in this area. And she was killed inside of her house. Police... Re um, Stephen Moore and his wife had been... Had been high school sweethearts. His wife, the former Linda Marine, was a graduate of Brattleboro High School, and her husband was a graduate of Bellows Falls High. Uh, the Moore's home is located on Tid's Corner, a sharp. Oh, let's see if that's there. Tid's Corner. That's not it, is it? No. So this is what's the name of this town? Hmm. Corner a sharp curve halfway between the villages of Gageville and Saxton River. Hmm. Villages of Gageville. Oh, uh, maybe right in there. What did they say that road was? Let me get the... Uh... Okay, Saxon's road. Really Tid's Corner. Weird, because it actually actually is a name, Tid's Corner. <laughs> it actually has two plate. Oh, that's those are Todd's though, so it doesn't actually say Tid's Corner. Hmm. Now somewhere around in that area, then not there. We'll say I don't know, right around in there maybe. That's the river they were probably talking about. That's kind of a sharp turn, but that's something else. How about it, like Tid's Road or something? Between the villages and Saxton River. That's the Connecticut River. Hmm, let's see where that is. That's over here. Jeez. Okay, so that's the Saxton River. Running around. And it comes down. Oh, okay. And here's the villages. That's the Saxton River. So, I bet you, you know, covered bridge road, forest. I mean, that's a pretty sharp turn right there. So I think we're kind of in the ballpark here. So they lived right there. Okay. Despite the regular traffic on the road, the house with an attractive red... Ah, maybe we can see that. Come on. Attractive red barn is relatively secluded. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> Wouldn't that be weird if that was it? <laughs> There's a, the one red building that's sitting out in the middle of... State police brought their mobile crime laboratory to the scene and more than a dozen investigators are combing the house and the neighborhood for evidence that leads into the night. Uh, State Police Lieutenant James Candon said at this time we don't have any solid suspects. Hall said anyone who might have been driving by the house and seen a vehicle or a person in the vicinity during the early afternoon should get in touch with State Police at the Rockingham Barracks. Uh, Candon refused to comment about the possible murder weapon. The Moors had lived in the large white colonial house since 1979. The home is located on the major road between Bellows Falls and Saxon River. Cars streamed by the house Tuesday 
After, um, after word of the murder spread, I never saw this much traffic on Route 121 at night. Linda Moore would not have been 37, uh, would have been 37 later this month, and she was highly regarded in the community as a devoted mother to her children. Uh, yeah, so there really isn't much information going on here. I'm not going to read this whole thing. Where's 121 here, though? So I think this was one. There's 121 right there, and then it comes in. Hey, thanks, Lee D. Not liver D at all. Dun da da da, she said. Yes, and you too, if you'd like to help out the channel, I'd appreciate it. We are uh, trucking on to the end of the month here. We've got, what, four days left, three days regular shows, and then uh, the donation night. I'm going to try to do at least 2500 more directly to the DNA fund because we're trying to fund the Addison County, and that would make it so it's possible if we have a good month the next month that we could completely fund that entire case so there you go witnesses and in, in Westminster sought by investigators. Last Monday, police said they wanted to question a subject they described as a 25-year-old white male of medium build who was seen on foot near the Moore residence in the early afternoon. That man, who may have been hitchhiking, reportedly had short dark hair and was wearing glasses. At the time, Cannon said police wanted to question the man regarding his possible involvement. When asked Sunday if the man seen in the driveway was a suspect in the killing, Cannon said whoever he is, he is an important witness that may have information we're interested in. Hey, awesome. I'm glad that you like that I'm so mean. This guy reportedly was in the driveway. We'd like to come we'd like him to come forward or have someone identify him. On the Friday after Stephen Moore found the body of his wife on the living room floor of the couple's home in Westminster, Candon said police had talked with an individual with a blue knapsack but said the person had been released. He said the person interviewed had fit the description of a man wearing a blue knapsack reportedly seen in the area of Moore's home on Saxton River Road. Well, there you go, Saxton's River Road. So, isn't that what we have right here? There it is, Saxton River Road. See, I think that's it right there. <laughs> so they live on Saxton River Road. And probably, so let me just put it right there. That's that sharp, current uh, turn they're probably talking about it stuck out right when we went there they have a psychological profile of the killer and were using it in their investigation so she was stabbed to death too he said police were not releasing details of that profile in a related development, Cannon said he would attend on Monday the first meeting of a task force set up to investigate at least eight unsolved homicides in Claremont, New Hampshire area. Asked if Moore's death could be related to any of the unsolved homicides that have occurred north of Westminster on the opposite side of the Connecticut River, Cannon said, I hate to rule it out. I don't know what they're saying over there and how it relates to us over here. But he noted that at least two of the Claremont area homicide victims had last been seen hitchhiking and a third had died of a blow to the back of the head. Cannon said there's a major crime problem in the area and we're concerned about it. So there you go. That was the 
Linda Moore situation, victim. And now we're on to 1987. Well, before we move on to that, though, uh, just before Linda Moore, so just before Linda Moore was murdered, there was an article in the paper, and this is it right here. A new Hampshire, Vermont task force investigating possible links in area homicides will focus on four a New Hampshire prosecutor said Monday, and those are four of the ones we've previously mentioned. Assistant Attorney General Robert Ma, or Moo, or whatever you want to, M-U-H. That's, that's what you guys type when you go, ah, my day was meh. Said no concrete evidence exists that any of the killings are linked. But no matter how many killers there are, they remain free. Hey, thank you very much. Mystic Rogue. Assistant Attorney General Robert Muss. Okay, that's what he said. Whether it's one person or several killers, the big concern is that whoever did this is still at large and may have the propensity to do this sort of thing again. Ma spoke at a news conference after a two and a half hour meeting of two dozen state and local law enforcement officers. I'm just going to call him Moo, okay? Moo said deaths on which the group will focus in, in on are those of Ellen Fried, which um, is, did I, did I go over Ellen, uh, Ellen, is it Fried or Friend? Hold on. Oh, they have Fried. Hold on a second. Oh, is that really what it is? Okay, hold on one second. Jeez. I thought it might, I thought it said friend. Man, what an idiot. Where is that? No, I have fried there. Did I type in? I just want to make sure she didn't exist in newspapers.com. And then I, if I didn't cut and paste, and I, I typed in her name, and I thought it was friend. Ellen fried, though. And then... That would have been, hers was, hers was 1984, and hell, there's only going to be one of those. Hmm, why is she mentioned in this article? That's, no hitter day, April 28th. God, how weird is that? Same year and everything. Somebody, somebody else. So I'm going to put in um, Vermont here. Okay, yeah, no, she wasn't in there. I did do a cut and paste. So, yeah, it wasn't... Uh, hmm. She wasn't in there. Weird. So they put together a task force here. They're focusing in on Ellen Fried, 27, of Claremont, New Hampshire. Her remains were found in woods in Kellyville, section of Newport, New Hampshire. A nurse at Valley Regional Hospital, Fried, had been missing since July 20th. So she was a nurse. Bernice Cortenmanchi, 17, of Claremont. Her skeletal remains were found last weekend in a Kellyville section of Newport. Same area. She also disappeared in 1984. She was hitchhiking when last seen. A nursing student. Cordomanchi worked at a Sullivan County nursing home. She had been stabbed repeatedly. Eva Morse of Unity, New Hampshire. A body tentatively identified as hers was found Friday in woods in Unity. She was 27 when she disappeared from Charlestown on July 10th. And when did, in July 20th, 84, uh, okay. Morse, the mother of 10-year-old girl, last was seen hitchhiking on Route 12 in Charleston, New Hampshire. Moose said that despite an autopsy conducted Sunday, authorities have not determined how Morse died or whether she was murdered. An unidentified man whose body was found March 11th behind a rest area off Route 12 in Charlestown Police say he was killed by a blow to the back of the head. 
So they're just talking about other ones. Mu said two factors suggested a link the proximity of the sites where the bodies were found and the dates when the victims disappeared. The investigators also will examine any possible connections to the murder of Linda Moore, 36, of Northwest Min Minister. Uh, Moore was stabbed 25 times in her living room, April 15th. So that, that's the one that the other guy was just talking, the other sheriff or detective or whatever he was was saying uh, in the Moore case. Moo said there is no information to suggest a link among any of the killings and the suffocation of a 15-year-old Joanne Dunham. Well, now i got to see what the hell happened to her. Is, has that one been uh, solved? Murder of Joanne... Joanne Dunham. Thanks. Drama must remain on the stage. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to put m remarks up on the, the screen. So on June 11, 1968, approximately 710, Joanne Dunham, age 15, was last seen while walking from her home on Rachie Mobile Homes in Charlestown, New Hampshire, en route to her bus stop. Ah, she hasn't, that hasn't been solved. God, are you kidding me? Look at that. No, I've done this one. <laughs> I guarantee you that face looks really familiar. Hold on a second. Dunham. Dunham. God, I had to have done this one. Ah, I know I've done that one. I don't know why. I don't know, I don't think her name's though is in my in the uh, Google Earth. On June 11, 1968, approximately 7.10, Joanne Dunham, age 15, was last seen while walking from her home. She never got on the bus. Her body was found approximately 4.15 the following day on a roped-off dirt road on Quaker City Road in Unity, New Hampshire, at approximately five and a half miles from where she was abducted. An autopsy determined that Joanne died of asphyxiation. You know, I wouldn't rule that guy out. He may have changed up his M.O. since this is right at the end. You know, this is... Well, she went missing in 1968, though. How could there be... Wait a minute. So what are they talking about here? Is that another Joanne Dunham? Are you, are you kidding me? There's no information... Stuff. Any of the killing and the suffocation of 15-year-old Jen in North Charleston, her body was found in 1968. That's her. Within a mile of where Morse's body was discovered. Man, wouldn't that be crazy if that was like early on in that killer's life? I mean, it's so close, right? So you, she strangled to death and maybe they developed, maybe, uh, like, let's say the killer was like 22 years old and he strangled her to death. And then 20 years later, he's 40-something, kind of in the prime of serial killer, and he's moved up to stabbing and other things. Wow, thanks again. Drama must remain on the stage. Thanks for all you do to give victims a voice. It's a big deal to do what you do seven days a week, and it doesn't go on nuts. Well, thank you very much. That was very kind. What do you guys think about that? Isn't that weird? Like it's in that same damn little tiny town. It's strangling that's also never been solved. See, that makes me always curious at that point. When you have a bunch of unsolved murders in an area, even if they didn't link them, what are the odds that it, at that point, since you didn't find the killer of any of them, that it might be the same killer on all of them. Because, you know, you do catch killers from time to time. Yeah, maybe she was one of the first ones. Makes it sort of interesting to go check out in that area if there's other ones. 
All right, then the, let's see. And then January 1st. Or, or January of 1987. I don't have the precise date of it. We have Barbara Agnew. This is another, a different case now. So, police fear that a registered nurse, boom. Isn't that weird? So is this person a patient or something? Uh, it's just from Norwich, whose car was abandoned at an Interstate 91 rest area over the weekend, may have been kidnapped or murdered. Police combed the northbound rest area in Hartford Thursday, searching for clues to determine what may have happened to Barbara Agnew, 39, a part-time nurse at the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. Agnew was last seen driving home to Norwich after a day of skiing on Stratton Mountain. Her car, a green BMW, was parked sideways in the rest area Saturday night and was reported as abandoned on Monday. Police said they found blood at on the front and back seats of the BMW and found her blood-stained outer clothing, a jacket, vest, and a sweater Tuesday in a nearby dumpster. Oh, boy. So she was stabbed to death in the vehicle, and then that clothing was taken off, thrown in a dumpster. So was, where, wow. So was this after, assaulted after death, or was that what it was even about? Uh, I don't know. I'm just going over this mystic rogue. So let's just let me cover it and see what happens. Detective Sergeant Theodore LeClaire, who was heading the investigation, said he could not tell how serious the wound was from the amount of blood discovered. He said the blood was in specks and that the stains were fresh. LeClaire said there was a st uh, still a chance that Agnew was alive and that she could have been kidnapped or that she could have just wandered off. He said Agnew spent Saturday skiing with a friend who was vid visiting Stratton. He said the man was an older gentleman, a businessman from Austria who was staying at a condominium at Stratton. He said the two were friends but were not romantically involved. Agnew had dinner with the man and then left for home during one of the winter uh, major uh, snowstorms. Police said Agnew's car was parked sometime Saturday night and was towed away Monday after a snowplow driver complained that it was in the way. Agnew's former husband, Dr. Kenneth Olson, uh, reported her missing Wednesday morning. Olson was apparently supposed to meet Agnew on Monday when she was scheduled to pick up their son under a joint custody arrangement, but LeClaire said the police were not alarmed about Agnew until Wednesday afternoon when the blood-stained clothing was recovered. Toby Ferris, who maintains the rest area for the state transportation agency, said he had noticed Agnew's car because it was parked perpendicular to the curb. Then on Wednesday, he went to empty the trash bin and he said he noticed the clothing. Ferris picked the clothing up and did not notice any blood on them, but he took them to the district highway office where a call was placed to the police. Thank you, Candy Douglas. Yeah, I, don't, we, I don't know, but I remember that face. Don't you remember that face, Zozo, on, that, uh, on the Dunham case? I just couldn't find anything in my... Uh, in here, I went D U, uh, you know, D U N H A M wasn't in there, so I don't know. Couldn't find it. But that face right there, I know I've seen this one. You think that was the school bus girl? Okay. I th well, we covered that one quite a bit and mapped it all out, so how could it not be in here? Walking from her home on Good Mobile Homes in Charleston, New Hampshire, and route to her bus stop on her way to school. No, because remember they found her. I don't think that's the same one. Because remember they found her. Um, 
her body kind of even on the route back to her house. Like she got dropped off by the school bus. And remember the people on the school bus said they could see a car that was following and then the bus drove off and then the car went down there. I don't think this is the same one. I mean, just because it mentioned the word bus, I don't think it's the same one. Approximately. Well, let me let me just look at this. Hold on. I'll I'll recognize it because I kind of remember what it looked like. So, home map. R A I C H E mobile. Mobile homes. Ah, jeez. That's that what I want. Yeah, there's a whole bunch uh, that have buses. I have like three stories that I've covered, at least, that have buses involved. R-A-I-C-H-E, Mobile, Homes, Charleston. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to... It's not the same one, though. All right, so let me get to the back to what I was doing. Leclerc said he would pursue the possibility of linking Agnew with other women, but first we have to find the body. So they're already talking about, even in this case, even though she's just missing, that, wow, you know, we've got all these other women still missing, you know, coming up missing in the area, and we're finding bodies, and they're killed in the same way. All right, so let's see. So that was in January, then March 29th. Body found maybe that of Barbara Agnew. The body of a young woman believed by police to be that of Norwich resident Barbara Agnew was found near a stream bank off Advent Hill Road Saturday by several hikers. So let's see, Advent Hill Road. And look look how it's just right in this. So here's Advent Hill Road, and probably since they said in a creek bed, I see a creek maybe. I don't know. Let's just say it's in here. I, I don't have the exact address where she was found. And let, let me try a different time of year where the tree, the foliage is clear. Should be like in the fall, October. Well, that one's easy. Yeah, so there's a creek right there. Or some water, anyways. Let me, let me, I bet it might be right here where it crosses something. No, we don't, there's no street view there. Looks like. Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering if it goes underneath the creek right there. But anyways, that's where her body was found. But look at, uh, you know, when you just kind of pan out, they're all right in here. I think the killer, well, it's hard to tell what direction, but I'm thinking maybe like over here and just kind of knows the area. Because I don't know if you'd put yourself in the middle of something like, Although, you know, Framingham is where one of the people started their journey, but would have went to Brat Battle Brew. So it's like the person knows this area really well. Her body was found more than 12 miles from the rest stop on Interstate 91 where her car had been found with blood stains on both the interior. So let's see where the I-91 is. And then we'll just kind of I-91. Oh, so that's that is I-91. <laughs> they should call him the I-91 killer based on this. I mean, this is just yeah. So she was found there. So 12 miles. I'm gar I guarantee it's down there, not the other way.
rest stops on I-91. There's one. She was found here. Hmm, I don't know. She's found there. I don't know if it's... Uh, this is 91. Well, maybe. Let's see what the distance is right there. It's five miles, but to drive there, how far would it be? Hold on. If you're right there and you went down, ding, 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 ding. And let's just say you take that exit and you drive up like this. No, it's... <laughs> Look at that. I'm not, I'm not just throwing it out there, but can you see that right? That number right there? 12 miles on the money. Okay. And that's how they measure stuff. They don't do crow flies. They do driving. So, man, that's all. I think that's almost exactly where that is. I went up like that, but if you went like uh, maybe... Right around in that area, anyways. Close. It's close. So maybe that's the stop right there. I don't know for sure. I'm just taking a guess. Rest area, right? And where did they say she went skiing? Uh, maybe that'll give us an indicate. Let me go back to that first one really fast. Registered nurse from Norwich whose car was abandoned at Interstate 91 rest area. Police can comb the northbound rest area. So it's a northbound in Hartford, though. So maybe that's not going to be... Well, is that a rest area on that side, too? And where's Hartford? Well, that's not, there's no, I-91 doesn't go over there, so that doesn't even make any sense. 91's right there, but this is Hartford. Okay, so is, it, is this considered Hartford right there, maybe? What do you guys think? Well, actually, we can tell, right, because I can hit the, there's got to be a button, on, on something to click. Hartford Welcome Center. Yep. <laughs> Feeling pretty confident that that's the one, but it might be on the northbound side. So is that what that is? I mean, let, let's take a look. That's it. that's way more secluded looking than the other side. But uh, yes, that is a rest area there. So now we know that it wasn't this one. It was right here. And that looks a lot more spooky and you gotta admit, like when you look at this rest area here compared to the other one that's wide open, you know. So that's probably the rest area in Hartford. It's even called the Hartford rest area. And then she was found on this road, um, Advent Hill Road. And to get there, it was exactly 12 miles to right there. So can I get a boom? I know there's people feverishly looking to see if it's not right or not. But even if it's not, I don't give a damn at this point. I just want to get through the, <laughs> the rest of this because it seems it's really interesting. He said Agnew spent Saturday skiing with a friend who was visiting Stratton. Remember, that's how, that's how it started. So... I wonder where they went skiing. It did say, but it doesn't really matter. So she was actually going this way, and then somebody killed her in her car, it sounds like, and then brought her over here, probably after assaulting her, brought her this way. Because it was 1987. Authorities say Agnew was stabbed to death. So there we go, we've got the same situation. Barbara Agnew of Norwich, whose body was found Saturday after an 11 
week search was fatally stabbed in the neck and stomach, according to an authority, an autopsy performed Sunday. Agnew's body was discovered Saturday afternoon lying under an apple tree near Advent Hill Road, a remote lane in Heartland. State medical examiner Eleanor Mc McKillen, or Mc McQuillan maybe, ruled the death a homicide and state police are searching for clues to her killer. Agnew was stabbed repeatedly in the back stomach, she said, exactly the same as he did to the other people. McKillen had not tested for signs of sexual assault. Agnew, a 38-year-old Norwich nurse, disappeared during a bad snowstorm on January 10th. Her green BMW was abandoned in the northbound rest area on I-91 in White River Junction. Specks of blood were found in the car on her ski jacket found in a dumpster nearby. State police believe she was assaulted and kidnapped while she stopped at the rest area. Yep. But she was probably killed at the rest area. And Adams, who lives in Advent Hill, said she went for a walk along the road Saturday with three friends with the recent warm weather, the snow banks and uh, shrunk had shrunk so that the walkers could see over the road into the fields about three quarters of a mile from her house she said she spied the body 89 feet from the road here hold on a second I feel like get something an exact spot here And this is in Heartland, Vermont, right? Ann Adams, right? And that sounds about right. She's going on a walk. She lived on, uh, Gotta be this person. Okay, Two seventy-five. Let's try this one. Nope. Hmm. Uh, she did live there at one time. What's the name of this road here? Yeah, that's not the... Uh, that's close, though. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she lived in Florida. Yeah, this is 82 to 84 in Burlington. That would have been, man. Seems like but that was after that. Uh, I don't have the right address for that. About three quarters of a mile from her house, she said she spied the body 89 feet from the road. There was quite a big blood stain on the snow. Ew. It's an abandoned. Yeah, hold on a second. Yeah. So this is White River Junction, so that seems like that's probably the rest area, because that's 91, and, you know, it's what, about a mile from there? 
Maybe, maybe well, probably like five, actually. Well, 2.21 miles from White River Junction. So I think that pretty well verifies that that's the right rest stop. Because you don't put rest uh, stops every two miles, right? Okay, well, uh, I couldn't find her specific address, but it, there was one that she, this lady lived up here, but this is the road here, and um, apparently she found her body after the snow melted a little bit, and she could see the blood all over the ground on the snow. All right. So let me move on to the next one. And the last person is Jane. Listen to this craziness. Jane Borowski. She was pregnant, seven months pregnant, and she was stabbed 27 times but lived, and the baby lived. I mean, I don't even understand how that's even, like almost, like how that's even technically possible. But, uh... It, it happened. And, but the nurse was 1988, okay? So then there was an article that came out in 1987, and it says, A man now living in Brattlesboro is an ex excellent suspect in the killing of possibly five women along the New Hampshire-Vermont border in the past three years. And because there is a significant likelihood of his being, of his being a danger to Brattlesboro, Warnings have been issued to medical institutions in town to alert their personnel to the particularly careful to be, oh, medical personnel. You hear that? To be particularly careful, according to an investigator. Several of the dead women worked as either nurses or nursing home aides. The suspect, according to sources, lived in Battlesboro previously. He then served time in a state institution for a sex crime. There you go. According to the, I hadn't even read any of these, but you could see where, where things might be going. After he was released, he returned to Battlesboro. The killing, the killings have occurred since he was out, a source said. Wow. So he was in prison for sex, or a mental hospital for sex crimes. And then he's out, and then he has sort of this fascination with nurses. Oh, boy. Well, anyways, I had to use the restroom. We'll be back in a second. Crazy, 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 crazy. The suspect, according to sources, lived in Brattlesboro previously, then served time in a state institution for a sex crime, according to the sources. After he was released, he returned to Brattlesboro. The killings have occurred since he was out, a source said. According to various press reports, police in Vermont and New Hampshire investigating the killings have long suspected that one serial murderer 
might be involved. There have been spec there's been speculation that the man may have been responsible for the murder of Sarah Hunter, 32. Well, now we got to do that one. Oh boy. Sarah Hunter murder. 30, okay, murder, Vermont, Golf Pro, Sarah Drives. So that was her. First year of golf professional. Her dream came to an abrupt end when she was abducted and murdered in the final days of the summer of 1986. The brutal crime and dismissal of charges last year in the case still resonate in the lives of those who live in Manchester. Wait, so that's probably an old article that was... Um, Well, when's this story? Detectives solved 1986 Vermont. But was that the one? I mean, I don't know if this is old or not, though. That's the thing. Dropped, see? 2015, the charges were dropped. Hmm. So it, it must still be open then. Interestingly. See how many cases there are, everybody? I mean, you're just trying to go over one case, and we've come up with two, you know. Dunham and this one. Law enforcement officials investigating the killings in the southern Vermont, southern New Hampshire area know the man's name, have talked with him, and know his whereabouts. He is not under active police surveillance, but police are aware of his movements. One source emphasized the dilemma of law enforcement officials. There are clear inferences that the man described by one source as middle-aged. Well, that makes sense because then you can add that 1968 killing of Dunham in there. There are interesting circumstances there, and there is circumstantial evidence to back up these assumptions. All this makes the man an excellent suspect, but police were cautious for legal and investigatory reasons to say anything um, for the record. Hmm. I wonder if he's in the paper. We have no prime suspect. There is a person in Battlesboro who is a suspect. Uh, police dilemma, as one of them put it, is that the evidence is not solid enough to charge the man with a crime, nor is there evidence that he will commit another murder. Nevertheless, police officials have been worried enough about the man's presence in Battleboro that they have asked staff members at nurses and let's see, and nurses at Battleboro Memorial Hospital, Battleboro Nursing Homes, and Battleboro Retreat to. Ugh, God, my stomach is. Just <laughs> to take certain precautions at night. This is crazy. Yarg. Three of the five murder victims were nurses and a fourth worked at a nursing home. Wow. The fifth killing of a woman in the area was that of Moore of Westminster. Although some sources are suggesting that Battleboro man is a suspect in this killing, other law enforcement officials are skeptical since it didn't uh, fit certain patterns. The five women, besides Miss Moore, who have been killed in the pattern in recent years are Barbara Agnew, a 38-year-old nurse from Norwich who died on or about January 10, 1986. Her bloodstained car indicated she was kidnapped from an I-91 rest area near White River Junction. Her body was found in a remote area several miles away. She had been stabbed repeatedly in the neck and stomach. Eva Marie Morse, 27, whose remains were found April 26, near Unity, New Hampshire. She was last seen hitchhiking near Westminster in July of 1986. She was a factory worker. She had stab wounds in the neck. Ellen Fried, 27, a nurse from Claremont, New Hampshire. Her skeletal remains were found near... Newport, New Hampshire, on September 19, 1985. She had been missing since July 
of 1984 and died of stab wounds in the neck. Yeah, so this this is, um, and then Bernie's Court Manchie, 17, his body was found near Newport on April 19, 1986, near the same wooded area where Fried's body was discovered. She was a part-time nursing home employee who disappeared when hitchhiking in 1984. Right. So that, these are, this is 1987, and then in 1988, after all of, you know, his last known killing, and actually, interestingly, the, the this article here is actually prior to the pregnant woman being, uh, uh, you know, when she was stabbed and she lived and the baby lived. Murder in the Valley. It couldn't have been any one of us. It could have been any one of us. Young women's car might have broken down at the lonely spot on the interstate that thickly snowing night. Anybody might have stopped to use the restroom or defroster on the blink to scrape the ice off the windshield. No one knows why Barbara Agnew, a 38-year-old nurse, pulled off into an Interstate 91 rest area in White River Junction that January night last year, or just how her killer overpowered her. No one knows her terror when after struggling to get back into her car, he hauled her out again, or how he drove her over miles of snow-covered rural roads before he finally stabbed her to death in a blizzard under a secluded apple tree in Heartland. The young girls don't jog on back roads in Heartland anymore, not without big dogs loping at their sides, small town women who once thought nothing of walking alone familiar streets after dark hurry faster or drive their drive, they lock their cars and check their back seats first. In Hartford, a town of about 9,000 that swells by a couple of thousand during ski season, Police no longer stick reports on missing wives into their notebooks and forget them. And when the local newspaper runs stories about the unsolved murders in the Connecticut River Valley, businesses boom, uh, business booms once again at the sporting goods stores and locksmiths. But soon after the newspaper has lighted the morning fire, business drops off again. The murders, five or eight or ten women, depending on whom you're talking to, have changed life in the valley, but subtly just about every buddy locks their doors, just like in Delphi now, but no intruders have been gunned down by nervous housewives, and Wayne Barrows hasn't been able to retire the money he'd made from gun sales. It's back to normal here said Barrows, manager of Norm's Gun Shop in White River Junction, where mace sales jumped about 2,000% after Norwich nurse Barbara T. Agnew was abducted and stabbed last year. Basically, the people around here, all those that were concerned about it, have protected themselves, whether it be with locks, mace, or handguns, he said. Anyone who had any doubts or fears they have satisfied themselves for their safety. At the, time of, at the time, there were a lot of different rumors about different people around here, Barrows said, but after three months, it died down to normal again. People forget about it and carry on normal life. The person out there is looking for someone like that. Not everyone forgets. If a body is found, or the radio runs an update on the Agnew investigation. Her phone starts to ring, said Judy Kaufman, owner of Upper Valley Lock and Key. So uh, this, this is a perfect example of how everything changes. Shortly before dark on Monday evening in April 1986, Vermont State Police in Orange Rain stickers searched the banks of the Sexton River across from the home of Stephen and Linda Moore. Linda Moore had been found stabbed to death in her home. 
That's what it what it should have said somewhere. It'll be women calling about a deadbolt, and she'll be very relieved, and it's a woman who's going to put it in. Police and prosecutors don't say there's a serial killer loose in the valley. Some will admit it. It's likely the same person killing more than one of the victims. No one will say if it's likely that the same person killed them all. And after several frustrating years of investigation, police are sniffing along a cold trail, hoping for the one break, the one lead that will turn up a murderer. The murders occurred over a four-year span, all young women all stabbed to death. The latest to die was Agnew, a part-time nurse from Norwich, kidnapped from her 1977 BMW in an Interstate 91 rest area in White River Junction on January 10, 1987. An excellent skier, she had been skiing at Stratton Ski Area that day and then gone out to dinner with an Austrian businessman. Four days later, her ex-husband reported her missing. Born a Canadian, one of the sisters she went to nursing school. Let's see, what is this? Did, did it end right there, or how does that start up right there? Missing. Hmm. Born a Canadian, one of four sisters, she went to nursing school in New Jersey, where she married a dentist, Kenneth Olson. They moved to Hanover in 1976, had a son, Leif, and divorced in 1983. Every other week, Agnew had her son with her as part of the custody agreement. Yeah, that's her. Uh, she was a nurse in the cardiac care unit. That's 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 kind of weird. That's where Chris works at the uh, as a CNA. She was a nurse in the cardiac care unit at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, and she always had sold medical equipment for Utah Company for a year a job that took her traveling across the country. She lived alone in an apartment complex, but dated a Rochester man and had gathered a... Yeah, my stomach is just... Did you hear that? It's like... <laughs> gathered a coterie of friends, those who knew her. Said. Um, she had planned to start classes at Vermont College that January to finish her bachelor degree in nursing. But a few days after her disappearance, police found her blood, flecked ski jacket, vest, sweater, and wallet in the rest area dumpster. Blood and strands of her hair were found near her car. Her skis were gone, taken by a thief who had tossed her unwanted clothing into the dumpster, police assumed. Friends feared the worst. On March 30th, four people out for a walk on a remote Advent Hill Road in Heartland, found Agnew's body under an apple tree dressed in blue ski pants and purple sweater. She was probably forced back into her car at the rest stop, taken to the wooded back road, and killed, police said. Oh yeah, so maybe the, her car was taken and drove, driven back to the rest area, then he got back in his car and drove away. She had been stabbed in the neck and stomach. A pool of blood had soaked into the snow around her body. So she was finished off there. That's right. So, huh. Well, that doesn't really make any sense. Because there's blood all over the inside of the, the vehicle. So he must have stabbed her, but she was still alive and then took her and then finished her off at this. Man, how lonely and scary that would have been. Linda M. Moore, 36, of Westminster had been stabbed, um, this is another victim, stabbed, uh, stabbed two, eight months before. Her husband found her at, at about 3 p.m. on April 15, 1986, on the living room floor in the well-kept white colonial home on Tid's Corner between Saxton River and Gageville, where they lived with their two children. Dressed in blue jeans and a sweater, she had been stabbed repeatedly. Born Linda Marine in Battlesboro, Moore went to Battlesboro Union High School in 1971. She married her high school sweetheart, Stephen L. Moore, a Saxton's River man. 
A housewife, Moore kept the books for her husband's contracting business, was an active mother in her school, and was president of the Rockingham Memorial Hospital Auxiliary. Well, that's interesting. Again, another... <laughs> I mean, even though she isn't a nurse, that's interesting. The uh, hospital again. A fact, those who bandy... That, oh, there you go. And it, right there, they say exactly what I said because we've been going over it. A fact that uh, who bandy the nurse stalker theory like to point out. Her special interest was a pro... So that means five of these people had something to do with nursing. Her special interest was a program she started four years before to provide... Uh, let's see, car... Now, this is a really huge article. So I'm, this is going to be the last thing, but I'm going to go through the whole thing. See, here's one of those shows where we're way longer than four hours, right? Uh, car seats for infants. Uh, both Agnew and Moore, police investigators say, were killed with particular savagery. Moore had 25 stab wounds in her body. Agnew had many wounds, too. Such psychopa uh, psychopathy. Clues to the killer's mind provide the murder itself may help find their killer. But it's harder to glean information from the deaths of three New Hampshire women who also died violently over the past four years. Their remains weren't found until at least a year after their deaths when little was left but bones. So you know it's weird. At first the, the killer wanted to get away with it. But in 1986, when the body started being found, he started to be, he, he liked the attention that he was getting in the newspaper. So then the later killings he made so that they were easily found, the one in the house, the one, you know, the car left at the, uh, you know, just, he knew that they were going to be found relatively quickly, just over the embankment in the middle of the snow, uh, one inside of a house. And I, I think that's exactly what he did. I think he was like, just happy to get away with it. He was reading the articles, but then he was really pleased. And then he, um, he, he, he wanted more, like a more frequent rush. So he made it so that they could easily be fi found. Fried had worked at Valley Regional Hospital. Let's see, I think we're on the next one. Um, Ellen Ruth Fried, a 27 year old nurse was a conscientious employee, a private woman who loved the outdoors, her friend said. One thing you might ask though is how would he have known that uh, Agnew was a nurse at that rest stop? Fried had worked at Valley Regional Hospital for two years when she got off the swing shift at 11 p.m. that Thursday, September 19, 1984. She didn't show up for work the next day, a fact that worried those who knew her. They were right to be worried. Her 1967 Chevelle was found two days later parked on Jarvis Lane in West Claremont, New Hampshire, locked and with the purse inside. Over a year later, let's see where, let's see where Jarvis Lane is. So this is um, fried, right? Wow, just right on that little tiny street right there. Right, just from right here to here. Fried, Fried's car. And... That's crazy, so she was fat. She was in one of these Kellyville area, so that's probably... Like seven miles away. God. That's similar to the the uh, rest stop situation, isn't it? Makes you wonder if he was maybe even in the car prior. You know, was he in the car? I don't know. God, just really strange. They were right to be worried. Her 1967 Chevelle was found two days later parked on Jarvis Lane in West Claremont, New Hampshire, 
locked and with her purse inside. Over a year later, on September 19, 1985, the remains of Ellen Fried were found in the woods in the Kellyville section of Newport, New Hampshire, eight miles from where her car was discovered. She had been stabbed in the neck. Bernice Cordomachi was only 17, a junior at Stevens High School in Claremont, who worked part-time at a nursing home and hoped to be a nurse someday. By the way, I got, um, it was Lee D. who posted a link in um, Discord to, just to the general story, so then I thought, well, hell, i got to look this whole thing up. Eva Marie Morse was a 27-year-old divorce factory worker with a 10-year-old daughter who lived in Charleston, New Hampshire, where she was born and raised. Oh, hold on. I think we were still up here on this one. Uh, Cordomanche. On May 30th, 1984, she ate supper with her parents. This is Cordomanche. Um, with the parents of her boyfriend, 19-year-old Toby Colby, with whom she lived in West Claremont. She then set off to hitchhike to Newport to meet Colby. Fishermen found her bones on April 19, 1986, in the woods off Cat Hill Road. And see, this is an opportunistic moment. See, the, the, the killer was just driving. He, wasn't even, he might not even have been hunting for a victim that night. So this one isn't a nurse, but he was driving on the road and picked her up as a hitchhiker. See, that's the thing, man. You could have these serial, serial killers, and they'll just take that as a, whoa, they're just driving around, somebody's hitchhiking, and boom, they're just going to, you know, go off script, basically, and, and uh, he killed her. I think that's why you have these other ones that aren't the same. It's almost like he was stalking the nurses, but the other ones that aren't nurses were maybe... Hitchhikers, right? Hmm. Two loggers found her remains clad in... Well, I, I just skipped way over some something here. Hold on. Fishermen found her bones on April 19, 1986 in the woods off Cat Hill Road in Kellyville, about two miles. So Cat Hill... Cat Hole Road. Let's see where that is. Cat Hole Road. Okay, so now I gotta move one of these. So this is uh, who are we talking about here? No, that's we're talking about Cordomancer. This one. So now we know exactly where that is. So off of this road somewhere, but it said in Kellyville, about two miles from the spot, Fried's body had been found. She'd been stabbed in the neck. Eva Marie Morse was 27 years old, divorced factory worker with 10-year-old daughter who lived in Charleston, New Hampshire, where she was born and raised, a short, heavy-set, dark-haired woman with glasses. She had taken the day off from her job at J.H. Dunning Corporation in North Walpole on July 10, 1985. She was last seen hitchhiking. Boom. Oh, my God. See, that's another one that wasn't a nurse. You see? I thought that made sense. See, that one one isn't a nurse, and she was hitchhiking. God, that's crazy. People were still hitchhiking in 86. I mean, man, we were done with that. She was last seen hitchhiking to Claremont. Two loggers found her remains clad in a maroon sweater and slacks. Off the Unity Stage Road on April 26, 1986, 11 days after Moore's murder, and six days after Cordomanchi's body was discovered, she too had been stabbed to death. Several common threads. See, that's the thing. After they reported in the paper that Cordomanchi and um, I believe Fried, they were found kind of around the same time. He he was just he loved it. He loved that attention. So then he quickly killed somebody else again, right after that. Several common threads connect their murders. All the victims were female, relatively young. All were stabbed to death, probably with a knife, and most of them in the neck. All but Linda Moore were discovered along the murders, 
occurred in a 50-mile long span within 15 miles of the Connecticut River. Yeah, two logger. So the previous one, um, Eva Marie Morse, two loggers found her remains clad in a maroon sweater and slacks off the Unity Stage Road on April 26, 1986. 11 days after Moore's murder and six days after Cordomanchi's body was discovered, she too had been stabbed to death. See? Several common threads connect them. We just went that to that part. But whether one person killed all or several of the victims is something even the police investigating the cases don't seem to agree on. Yeah, I, I think it's the same person. Even so, says Detective Sergeant Ted LeClaire, his gut tells him there could be a serial killer at work in some of the slang. So this article here is 1988, you know, right at that time. And in fact, the, the woman who was pregnant hadn't even been stabbed yet. So that's another victim, but she lived. Both are stymied, they say. Both crimes were vicious. Uh, let's see, hold on. Uh, Ted Le Claire has been investigating Agnew's death. Mike LeClaire is working on Moore's, but they work closely with each other and with other police up and down the valley. Both are stymied, they say. Both crimes were vicious, and both, it appears, were without motive. No knives linked to the killings have been found, but neither LeClaire is about to give up. It's very frustrating investigating investigation, Mike LeClaire said, leaning back in his chair. First of all, we're not geared for a long-term investigation. Most homicide cases are solved relatively quickly, and with the Agnew and Moore cases, that didn't turn out to be the run-of-the-mill investigation. Linda Moore was a very uh, typical housewife in appearance with only a slight connection to nursing. Agnew was on her way back from a dinner at a ski area. See, that part was weird. That How would he have known that? She looked more like an out-of-state skier than a nurse. I can't believe we have a serial murder preying on nurses. But it's possible, said LeClaire, and other investigators, that the same person may have killed them both, if, o if only because of the savagery. A murder without... I mean, some... You know, it's just weird that there's four or five people associated with nursing. Four nurses and somebody working at a, as a hospital auxiliary or whatever the hell that was, you know. <laughs> um, you know, were a couple of them just accidentally nurses, maybe? Like, maybe Cordomanchi was just driving... And her car and you know he was at the rest area stalking people and that's the one he chose and didn't know that she was a nurse unless he was in her car before that <laughs> yeah but it's possible said Leclerc and other investigators that the same person may have killed them uh, what makes him tick wondered Lieutenant Michael L. Prazo is it the weather? Is it a song? Does he like the press? When it dies down, oh, look at this. When it, when it dies down, does he go out and do something to get back in it? <laughs> See, I, I totally think that. Robbery was not the reason, nor does sexual assault seem likely. The bodies of New Hampshire women could not offer any clues, but neither Moore nor Agnew was raped. Hmm. But there is no doubt the killer was angry. The overkill to me is... So maybe he was angry about how he was treated at the hospital. And what kind of treatments was he given at the hospital? You know, the, the suspect that they came up with later is what I was wondering. Uh, these are heavy-duty things to live with. Unless this person lives all alone and is a hermit, someone suspects, he said. They may, not e they may not want to believe it, but they suspect. Look at the facts. He was out late at night. He probably would have had blood on him. He would have acted differently. Someone, a wife, a mother. This is the same thing people say about Delphi. A father would have noticed the little quirks in his personality. 
They have seen the blood, but they didn't want to admit it. We need information from those people before another murder happens. Police on both sides of the river say they are still pursuing leads, running down tips, adding to the case files. But now they are more likely to exchange tips on the murders over coffee or while they are meeting about something else. With not enough to keep it busy, a task force formed in spring of 1986 by New Hampshire State Police and police from Claremont and Newport was disbanded last August. The office and phone put to other uses. 15 investigators started out tracking down the Agnew murder. Now only Ted LeClaire works on it about 20 hours a week. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to read the rest of this because it's just kind of talking about that part. What does it say right here? Hold on. Uh, where you don't have an extreme degree of disorganization, you're probably dealing with someone. The most widely used term is psychopath. That's a personality disorder. That's not a crazy person. That's not a person responding to voices telling them what to do. That's not a person who would draw undue attention walking down the street. A Ted Bundy type, he said. Was Agnew's killer disorganized? Let me say this, said Ted LeClaire. This was not somebody's first murder. Nor do the mentally ill slip by the keen eye of their neighbors for long. Those kind of people you get a line on, especially here in Vermont, Mike LeClaire said. It's not a big secret. Everybody knows them. You can go down to Mini Mart in Chester and say, who are the crazies around here? Serial killers can be the Otis Tools and Henry Lee Lucases of the world. Infamous murderers who traveled the nation interstates to find their victims. Well, this is before they realized that he really probably only killed two people, maybe one. Henry Lee Lucas. Uh, but when you have the more local variety... Philpin said, they live here, they work here, they shop at Grand Union. Police have said the killer probably lives within a 50-mile radius. Yeah, I think right where I was circling over there. Look at the facts. There was a blizzard that night. We had a person leave the interstate and travel 14 miles out into the boondocks. And they knew where they were going, exactly. Uh, it's a person not uh, is a person not familiar with the area going to do that. Never mind a blinding snowstorm. <laughs> yeah, boom. Now this is exactly what we were. I was saying a couple of minutes ago. It was like uh, you know he probably lives right in this area and he knows the area. Not that that's you know some amazing. Yeah, it probably lives within 50 mile radius of the area, a concentration with which Philpin agrees. Look at the facts. There was a blizzard. Is a person not familiar with the area going to do that? Never mind a blinding snowstorm. The killer's vi uh, viciousness could point to several kinds of motive, he said. He may have been motivated by sheer rage or by fear of the victim. We could be talking about the victim being perceived as powerful and indestructible. He might have said, She'll st she's still making noises. What do I have to do to stop her? Yeah. And this article is in the description. There was actually um, a composite that somebody, the surviving person, came up with right there. Uh, let me. So here's this one. At around midnight on April 6th, 1988, this is after that article we just read, Jane Borowski, then 23 and seven months pregnant, was returning home from a county fair where she stopped at a vending machine next to a market near Winchester, uh, New Hampshire. After returning to her car with her drink, a man appeared next to the door asking about the payphone. 
He then opened her door and began to attack her. He pulled out a knife and claimed she had hurt his girlfriend. However, she denied this. She tried to run, and he chased her and stabbed her 27 times. Afterward, the attacker got in his car and let... Look how freaky this is. Afterward, the attacker got in his car and left Jane to die. She crawled back to her car and managed to drive her to her friend's house two miles away. However, en route, she was disturbed to find that she was right behind the attacker's car. When she got to her friend's house, he stopped for a second, like probably looking behind him, and then drove away. Fortunately, both she and her newborn baby survived. With the investigation at a standstill, detective brought in a criminal, and, you know, blah, 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 blah. So it goes on. You guys can read that part. But, uh, man, what a crazy story. I'd never even heard of this one, had you? <laughs> I mean, this is one of those unsolved serial killer stories. I'm sure it's had shows on television and whatnot, but I'd never heard of it. And, uh, wow. That's crazy as hell there. But uh, that's going to be it, you guys. That was a four, three hours and 43 minutes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, hold on. Find out. Yeah, no problem. Thank you guys too for the uh, super chats. <laughs> Let you guys look at blue for a minute. So thank you to uh, Jessica Schubach, Lane S, Cindy Lynn, Nellie Bug, Zozo, Lee D, Cindy Lynn, Mom of Four, Kathy Frydenmaker, Linda Howell, JSD, JSD again, Lori Fisher, Mary Glaviano, uh, Mom of Four, RM Bell, Kathy Frydenmaker, JSD, So Kind, Susanna, Matt, Gilla, Padre, Let Freedom Ring, she said. Matt Pavia, Kathy L, Eugenie, Vicky Horn, Mama She 13, Kit Kat, Kit Kat again, Mama She 13, Hater Nation News Network, Randy C and Kit Kat again. Thank you very much, Kit Kat. You got to call in one of these days again. Everyone wants to hear that nice, happy voice. <laughs> Mama She 13, uh, Mary Glaviano, Lee D. Mystic Rogue, Drama Must Remain on the Stage, and Drama Must Remain on the Stage again, and Candy Douglas. And thank you guys very much for your support there. And I guess you could say Drama Must Remain on the Stage. The combination was a cat eye donation. So thank you. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I don't think I'm going to do any uh, after this. I got to go. I got to. Go get something to drink. Not a drink drink, but <laughs> my stomach's messed up. So, all right, you guys. Thank you. We'll see you tomorrow. And as I always say, everybody, until next time, be safe out there. And a two, and a three, and a... Yeah, I've been doing this true crime thing for quite a while now. And during this whole time, yeah. I have not seen one person that is a... Yeah. Dissector, for rejector, certified in my detector, gonna get you on a structure. If you try and play me like an old projector, crime sector is my nectar. That's a great is gonna give another lecture. I'm cold, nectar, reconnector, and I'm always gonna be a papa tector, fool deflector, interceptor. And I'll meet him in a speaker with a vector on his pector with all respect. Remember, I have a temple fucking check ya. I, I have no agenda. I'm the pretender. And I'll serve it to you straight without the blender. And in the end, end up, I'm, I'm gonna send ya on a military offender. Hey, shut up, guys. I was doing it.
Yeah, so I'll just get right back to work. All right, everybody. Talk to you. Okay, everybody. See you later. Hey, wait a minute. They wanted to rap, too, and you said, oh, I'm the only one that raps. Well, I am great. They only like me when I rap. Ask him. Ask him. Who does? Who likes Timmy and who likes John Boy rapping? Hey, Ellis, uh, they're here, too. They just wanted to throw a little something in there, and you, you know, you don't need to get on them for that. Okay, great, gee. You're so mean to me. <laughs> Oh my god, that's a little overboard, don't you think? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Bust it again. All right, you guys, see you tomorrow. And as I always say, everybody, be safe out there. Don't say it. Don't do it. Okay. All right, good. All right, see you later.